Hello and welcome to Lecture 6 on William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. And this is not going to be the last lecture. Let's call this Lecture 6 Part 1. And tomorrow I uh, will uh, upload Lecture 6 Part 2. Today we're going to turn to Act 4. And tomorrow, hopefully finish the play, uh, we'll turn to Act 5 and finish the play tomorrow. Um, and in our last lecture, uh, we left our lovers in the woods verbally and physically abusing each other. And uh, I'm always reminded of Puck's famous uh, line in the play, Lord, what fools these mortals be. That's what he tells his Lord Oberon. Lord, what fools these mortals be. And yes, love under the, uh, the spell of that romantic emotion called love, uh, mortals can behave irrationally, can't they? And we've seen that uh, that irrational behavior causes all kinds of, all kinds of madness and mayhem and lunacy and harm and hurt, pain and suffering. Um, and Shakespeare can't find a problem. Uh, I, I mean, he can't find a, a, a solution for this problem, this uh, romantic view of love. He can't seem to find a solution. Well, he, the only solution he is able to find in this play, he has to, as I said before, uh, he has to dip his quill pen into that invisible ink of the supernatural realm and that, uh, and with that, with that invisible ink, he uh, is able to resolve these lovers' problems. But you can see a supernatural answer is not uh, going to uh, uh, ultimately resolve the problem. Um, so, you know, let's turn to that uh, how Shakespeare begins to resolve the problem. Before we turn to Act 4, uh, let's turn back, let's turn back, yes, to the very end of Act 3, I promise, this is the end of Act 3, uh, Puck's final lines in the Act, I'm on page 1376, and I'm at line 449. And, uh, you know, now uh, Lysander and uh, Demetrius on the verge of killing each other over their love for Helena. And Helena hunting down, uh, or Hermie rather, hunting down Helena in the woods, ready to claw her eyes out. Uh, this Mr. Baker Puck, inadvertently he's caused a lot of harm, but he's actually enjoying it, isn't he? Lord, what fools these mortals be. Uh, that's probably the worst, uh, the worst thing about Puck is that he delights in mischief making, in pranks, being a prankster and causing uh, people distress and harm. But um, here he is now, he's going to resolve the problem. Oberon has given him the antidote. And you see the word dotage or doting or to dote in the word antidote and this magical potion that Oberon has again another supernatural element in the play but there's really no such thing as a magical antidote potion um, again this uh, this antidote I haven't seen too many critics talk about the antidote they talk about the magical flower juice and we've seen that that symbolizes uh, the romantic view of falling in love at first sight. But the realist, of course, steps in and says, no, no, no. It's all about sex. It's all about the hormones. But uh, no, I haven't seen too many critics. I don't think I've seen any critics discuss this antidote potion, this magical antidote. But if the magical flower juice is symbolic of this romantic notion, this romantic view of falling in love at first sight, the antidote, I would argue, uh, again, from the Romantics' perspective, is symbolic of falling out of love, which is just as mysterious for the Romantic as falling in love. They're, they 
the romantic simply doesn't have an explanation other than something supernatural is going on. It's magic. So this, uh, this idea of falling out of love, which can be just as painful uh, as falling in love, particularly for the person uh, who is no longer loved, who once was, only yesterday, but today, no, something's changed. There's that idea of uh, uh, the problems with uh, pers our personal identities. But uh, the antidote then is symbolic, uh, from the romantic perspective, it's symbolic of this idea of falling out of love, this mysterious uh, phenomenon of falling out of love. But the realist again is going to say, no, it's just that the hormones are now, they aren't racing any longer. Uh, you know, they're not stimulating. And so uh, someone's perhaps become too used to his or her soulmate and is no longer that enthusiastic or interested. You know, the first, the first few weeks in the bedroom, uh, lovers cry out to each other, catch me, catch me, catch me. And they're having such, such a good time. But you know, after a few weeks, it's catch me, catch me, or not tonight, I have a headache. But at any rate, so Puck is going to place now the antidote uh, potion, the magical antidote, onto Lysander's sleeping eyelids. And uh, he does so on page 1376. At the very end of Act 3, sing to line 449. And listen to what Puck says here. He says, On the ground, sleep sound. I'll apply to your eye, gentle lover, remedy. And he squeezes the juice upon Lysander's eyes. And then Puck continues, When thou wakest, thou takes true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eye. Again, notice this. This word, true, sounds as if Puck, too, a romantic, isn't it? True delight. It is a true delight. <clears throat> it's true love. And mm, that word, lady, that alerts any of us, you know, who are uh, battling the patriarchal order. Thy former lady's eye. Remember, there's the Lord and there's the lady. The Lord rules over the lady, and the lady has to behave. She has to, you know, she has a, 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 adhere to a particular uh, cultural uh, code of behavior. And then Puck says, And the country proverb known, that every man should take his own. It's interesting, the country proverb, and of course for Shakespeare and uh, people at the court in Elizabethan England, uh, people of the city, you know, the, it, traditionally speaking, people who lived in the country were perceived as uneducated, and therefore ignorant of, uh, you know, they, they lacked knowledge. And uh, this is a country proverb that we're hearing here, which suggests that not too much thought has gone into this particular proverb that every man should take his own. And again, that word take, just again, a subtle suggestion with that word. We know what that, the connotation, uh, what the suggestion is here, take. Uh, the man rules again. So uh, this, uh, this notion that we're moving toward a happily ever after ending where the lovers will be reunited, uh, um, Demetrius with Helena and Lysander with Hermia, there are these indications in here that this is not going, these relationships are not going to be relationships of equality. Remember, the romantic imagines that, yes, you know, you're partners in this relationship and that you each, uh, one is willing to compromise for the other because ultimately what matters most is the relationship. Um, I'm reminded of a beautiful line, there is the romantic in me. I'm reminded of a beautiful line from uh, the musical, The Music Man. And the woman, the protagonist, the heroine of the story, she wishes to fall in love. And uh, the line uh, says that, she says, and I would like him to be 
her dream lover, she would like him to be more interested in me than he is in himself and more interested in us than in me. It's a lovely expression of uh, romantic love, isn't it? That two people come together, I'm interested in you, you come before me, you're my honey bunny after all, you come before me. But what comes first? I want you to be interested in me more than you are in you, but what comes first is our relationship. That is what, is all, that is what matters most, not me, not your, not your wanting to please me and uh, uh, valuing me more than you value yourself, but you value the relationship above all. And that suggests that it is a relationship of compromise, doesn't it? But we've seen, no, that's not what's happening in this play. The men, they dominate, they rule, they govern, they command. Uh, they're always issuing directives to the women in their relationships. So, again, this notion of uh, the idea of take Shakespeare, you know, the idea that those living in the country, uh, it, it's as if you're regressing in time to a, a period when men and women were not equal and men ruled over the, the women in the household, but Shakespeare knows that he's making a joke here um, about the patriarchal order and men's assumptions that they are superior to women. And the country proverb known that every man should take his own in your waking shall be shown. Yes, it is going to be shown ultimately in the end that the men in this play, they will reassert their, uh, 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 their superiority, their authority over uh, the women. Jack shall have Jill, not she'll go ill. That's interesting, it refers to a nursery rhyme here. Again, we think of the country, the nursery rhymes. Again, nursery rhymes are for children. They please children, but you grow up and you realize nursery rhymes, fictions. And, you know, I was thinking this Jack and Jill, not shall go ill. Let's think of the nursery rhyme, Jack and Jill. Uh, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. They got a problem, don't they? They're thirsty. They went up there to fetch a pail of water. Or maybe Jill has to do the laundry. But at any rate, Jack fell down. He's no longer king of that hill, is he? He fell down and broke his crown. There's a crown, the king. <laughs> Punning on the word crown, perhaps. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. I mean, it is a catastrophe for Jack and Jill, doesn't it? And here it says, Jack shall have Jill, not shall go ill. So maybe again, this is Shakespeare's subtle way of reminding us, look for something deeper beneath the surface here. Yes, on, uh, uh, this play at the end, it's going to appear to be a happily ever after ending, where naught shall go ill in the future. They shall live happily ever after, but like Jack and Jill, you know, their desires have led them up the hill where, you know, they, they are now masters. They, they, they are king of the hill, but they fall, they each fall down. Jack, of course, is the one with the crown. He's the ruler here. And Jill comes tumbling after. Not shall go ill. And then this last line is particularly dark, isn't it? Very disturbing. Uh, the man shall have his mare again, and all shall be well. All shall be well. Shakespeare is going to resolve the problems, all of the problems, using this supernatural uh, uh, potion, this magical antidote. He will resolve all of these conflicts that we've raised uh, over the course of these lectures, uh, beginning with that, uh, the true nature of true love. Um, but it's the man, notice the image here, the man shall have his mare. Notice the, the metaphor, the woman is the mare. A mare is a female horse, and the man rides on top of the female horse. The man is at the reins of the female horse. He controls the horse. And the man, of course, uh, uh, poetically speaking, traditionally, 
speaking, uh, the idea is that the, uh, that the man upon the horse, the man symbolizes consciousness, reason, and the horse symbolizes uh, 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 the subconscious. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, um, the beast, the animal, irrationality. And it is up to the man to keep the horse in check, to keep the horse, you know, to tell it when to, when to pace, when to trot, when to gallop, and so forth, but to keep, uh, through reason, to keep one's desires. So the horse represents here the desires, and many of these desires at the subconscious level we're not aware of, you recall. Um, so it's the idea that the man is representing reason here, and the horse, the mare, the animal is the uh, uh, desires. And so the man, if the man should fall off the horse, if reason should fall off the horse, the horse runs wild. And one's desires become a wild animal, a wild beast. Uh, in one of Shakespeare's plays, uh, Richard III, at the end of the play, Richard uh, uh, does fall off his horse and he cries out, a horse, a horse, a kingdom for my horse. He's calling out for someone to provide him with another horse. And of course, Shakespeare's suggesting that Richard III is a man whose desires have run wild and he, he is no longer uh, a man governed by reason and uh, all the chaos and the madness that ensues, not only the harm, uh, the death to others, because he kills a lot of people in that play, has them butchered, including two little children, the little princess, but uh, harm ultimately comes to Richard as well. He is defeated on the battlefield and brutally slain by his enemies. But the man shall have his mare again, and all shall go well. Yeah, on the surface again, all shall go well. But again, this image of the man, he shall have his mare. Uh, this is not, once again, this is undercutting, once again, this romantic vision, this romantic view of what a romantic relationship is, uh, this equality between partners. And we, we're constantly seeing a clash of egos here. The ego gets in the way. The, the desire for sex gets in the way. The cultural upbringing, uh, the indoctrination, the brainwashing that these lovers have experienced uh, in being born in this time, in this place, in this culture, this society, we see all of those desires that they've learned at their mama's knee. We see those desires getting in the way as well. But Shakespeare shall resolve the problem. All you need is an invisible inkwell. So when thou wakes, thou takes true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eye. And the country proverb known that every man should take his own in your waking shall be shown. Jack shall have Jill, not shall go ill. The man shall have his mare again, and all shall be well. Well, all shall be well. I'm looking forward to this happy ending, aren't you? But before the man has his mare, uh, we, uh, the, patriarchal, the patriarchal order, before we reestablish this patriarchal order, let's turn to Bottom and Titania uh, in Act 4, Scene 1, uh, the scene where they are holed up in uh, Titania's bower. And uh, again, the, what we have here is uh, the animal, the beast within Titania has been loosed. It's running wild. Uh, she, uh, her, uh, she is uh, uh, on the, she is cooking on this chemical concoction, the magical flower juice. And we have, once again, this notion of love's irrationality. Uh, and it's interesting here, this, this idea of personal identity that we talked about last time, the idea that in different situations, in different circumstances, with the passage of time, we're constantly changing. Uh, there's no such thing as a soul or a spirit, or if you're not of a religious uh, belief, a self. Uh, something within, 
some people believe consciousness, they call it a self, and they imagine it to be some sort of non-physical thing that is stable and fixed and doesn't change, never alters over time. From that we get this notion of true love that lasts forever. Uh, this idea of personal identity, we see the realist stepping in once again saying no. Uh, uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, your personality is undergoing, your, your identity is undergoing all sorts of changes all the time, depending on various situations, circumstances, the place you are, the time, uh, and so forth. And so uh, this identity of yours, there's no self, no soul, no spirit, there's just the brain. This identity of yours is fluid. It's as if there are many, many selves within, and new selves always arising uh, uh, because the brain is a physical thing and it's constantly, uh, it's constantly, you know, out in the world and constantly uh, acquiring new knowledge, new information, and deriving new truths from that knowledge. And so, you are many selves. This idea of uh, Again, I use that word self, but this idea, your brain is many brains. Uh, this idea that you are constantly, in, uh, uh, your personality, uh, your identity is constantly in flux. And here we see it again with Titania, don't we? Because formerly Titania was this proud, regal, fairy queen, uh, right? And she's uh, refusing uh, Oberon. Uh, uh, she's forsworn his bed and company. So this is a a woman who can keep her passions in control, or I should say a, a fairy, a fairy female who can keep her passions in control, it would seem, yet here under the influence of the magical flower juice, uh, no, the situation has changed, the hormones, as I said, are brewing, and a look uh, how we find her here. Uh, yeah, well maybe before, do I need to, yeah, oh, I wanted to mention before we actually talk about this scene, so, yeah, Titania has become a kind of predatory beast in this scene, hasn't she? I mean, earlier we saw these indications of, uh, uh, you know, I used the, uh, the metaphor of a dominatrix. She has bottom bound and, and gagged and dragged back to her bower against his desire. He simply wants to get out of those woods, doesn't he? But no, she refuses. She says, I am a spirit of no common rape. And she whirls over the seasons and that's how powerful she is. But what we have here, I was thinking, when I was thinking about this scene last night, we have a kind of perversion, don't we, of the Beauty and the Beast fairy tale, if you will. Here we have Titania, uh, uh, and I, I say perversion rather than inversion, because we have Titania who becomes the sexual monster, if you will, in this, this scene, and Bottom who has literally been transformed into a beast. So we sort of have the fairy tale here of the beast and the beast, rather than the beauty and the beast. And of course, uh, Titania here is the one who is the far more dangerous, I would argue. Although we're going to see Bottom, he can become quite tyrannical in this scene. Once he's given a little bit of power, we're going to see him run with that power and uh, use it to his personal advantage, to his personal gain. And this relationship, too, of the image of Titania and Bada, um, again, you know, the idea of, uh, the idea of, it's a subversion, I guess you, would, you could say, uh, of love. Because the romantic view of love is that each of the individuals is special and unique and something to admire, something holding quantity. Thing, remember Helena's phrase, things base and vile holding no quantity, love can transpose to form and dignity. So the romantic views the, uh, his or her relationship as a relationship of form and dignity, of respect, and it's true, it's sincere, it's honest. And uh, here we have, instead, we kind of have a subversion of this idea of the romantic uh, view of why lovers are drawn to one another here. Uh, again, it's the hormones. This is why uh, Titania is drawn, is attracted, why she's so desirous of bottom. It's the hormones. But it's also, I would argue, that this image of Titania and bottom is also a subversion 
uh, of the representation of human sexuality. So we have this romantic representation of human love, but we also have the romantic representation of human uh, 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 sex, of sex between lovers, don't we? Remember, the romantic imagines that uh, their union is sacred, it's blessed, and that it isn't simply a union between uh, the physical bodies, but it's a spiritual connection. Uh, it's the, the, the joining of soulmates, if you recall. It's a sacred bond. And once again, I would say uh, that's what this image of Titanium Bottom uh, is subverting, is this idea, this sacred bond, this spiritual connection. Um, it hardly appears to be that in this scene, doesn't it? Uh, does it? Do yeah, it doesn't appear to be that, does it? Uh, this sacred bond, this union between uh, the uh, fairy queen who's hopped up on, she's drugged, and bottom, uh, whose head has been changed into that of a, a, a jackass to remind us, you know, of the beast, to remind us of the beast within, and it, in, and uh, to Tanya, of course, the ego, the beast within, the ego, bottom, remember, it has this uh, enormous ego, and then of course so does Titania, but Titania here also reminds us of her enormous sexual appetite. I mean, she is just a voracious predator in this scene, isn't she? Um, so yeah, I think Shakespeare's subverting not only the romantic view of love, but the romantic view of uh, uh, sex between true lovers. I mean, if you go, in many of our films today, you always see uh, whenever two people uh, uh, have sex on the screen, let's use the term make love, because we're, let's say we're in, a romant we're in a romantic, we're watching a romantic film. When they make love, you always have the violin scores in the background and the soft lighting, and you know, the lovers are equally passionate, and, and then you have the, uh, the music rise to a crescendo, and uh, as the lovers, you know, uh, reach that all uh, important moment, that ultimate expression of their uh, physical and spiritual union, and it's the mutual orgasm as always uh, in the uh, romantic's mind. They experience a mutual orgasm together. Uh, yeah, that's being undermined here, as we shall see in, in more detail in this scene here. But, um, yeah. I think I've said enough. Yeah. Did I have any more introduction? No, that's enough. All right, let's turn to the text. I'm on page 1374, and I'm at the top of the page, line one in the scene. This is the scene between Titania, and uh, she's under that influence, and Bottom. Uh, both of these uh, uh, characters have metamorphosed. They have been translated into something we don't recognize. Uh, Remember, under the influence, the, under the hormones, the, your personal identity can really change, can't it? You can become someone you never realized existed, and that's what we see happening with Titania, which again, the realists would argue this underscores yet again that you don't have a fixed personal identity, uh, particularly when you're under this, the, the, the influence of the, the, the sex drug. Uh, so Titania says, uh, Come, sit thee down upon this flowery bed, while I that amiable cheeks do coy. So, uh, you know, she's drawing him in beside her on the bed, and she's, uh, you know, caressing his cheeks. I mean, uh, she's just, uh, again, as I said, she, uh, she wants her, and she wants bottom. Uh, uh, sexually, and stick, and she says, while I thy amiable cheeks do coy, and stick muck, musk roses in thy sleek smooth head, and kiss thy fair large ears, my gentle joy. Uh, she's just all over that ass. Yes, absolutely. And uh, we know what her mind is on. You know, we know what she's thinking here. She's moving in, the sexual predator, uh, ready to uh, go.
gobble up her prey. But look at Bottom, look at his response. He ignores her completely. Where's Peace Blossom? Yeah, if you think about it, this is kind of a battle of the egos in this scene, isn't it? Uh, Titania, of course, uh, her sexual desires, and Bottom, he has uh, the desire for food. <laughs> uh, they're, they're not really in the same uh, uh, play, are they? They're not on the same page here. So he's completely ignoring her. I mean, his, he's not interested. He's disinterested in, in uh, her advances. Where's Peace Blossom? Ready. And what does Bottom want? Scratch my head, Peace Blossom. And Bottom wants his, uh, you know, his physical needs met, but not uh, his sexual needs. Scratch my head, Peace Blossom. Where's Mr. Cobweb? Ratty. Mr. Cobweb, and he tells Mr. Cobweb to bring him some honey, uh, 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 the honey bag from the bumblebee. So we can see Bottom's mind is not on sex here. Um, it's on food. It's on his uh, uh, physical comforts. He wants his, uh, he wants his head scratched. And he calls on Monsieur Mustard Seed. And he wants Mr. Mustard Seed, uh, Mustard Seed says, what's your will? And again, will, that's an interesting word here in this passage, meaning desire. What's your desire? What do you want? Well, we know what Titania wants, but not Bottom. What's your will? He says, nothing good, Monsieur, but to help Cavaliere Cobweb to scratch. So this scratch, this itch he has is particularly bothersome, isn't he? Of course, the humor here again, you know, is Bottom doesn't realize. He doesn't. Uh, he's completely in the dark. He doesn't know that his head has been changed into that of a jackass. And he's, he's uh, itching all over it. He just can't understand why. Look what he says next. I must to the barbers, monsieur. For methinks I am marvelous hairy about the face. You can see him rubbing his face there. And I am such a tender ass. If my hair do but tickle me, I must scratch. Look at this metaphor. This is interesting. I have never seen a critic point this out. But um, look, he's such a tender ass. And again, Shakespeare reminding us of our egos and how the reason that it, they, our egos need to be fed is underneath we have this fear of being um, not important, not significant, not unique. Otherwise, why would we need? What would be the need for our egos to be fed? Why would we go out into the world and try you know, to climb that mountain, and be cream of the crop and top of the heap? Why would we do that if underneath this desire, this pleasure, this carrot that we see, it's just a removal of that whip? We're all tender asses, aren't we? We all have these frail, fragile, egos that need stroking and bottoms need scratching. He's a tender ass and he says, if my hair do but tickle me, just the littlest thing can damage our egos. The littlest thing, a look from someone. We can imagine too where nothing was intended. Just the tiny, that's how that's how frail our egos are. And some people's egos are so frail, I mean, it's not enough they have a billion dollars. They got to have a billion, 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 and then a trillion dollars. And it isn't enough that one athlete wins, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, uh, 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 the gold medal. He's got to have five gold medals, ten gold medals. The actress can't just win one Academy Award. She wants two, and then three, and then four. It's just never enough. Our egos aren't satisfied. We're always, we're always fretting, aren't we, that we just don't matter. We're such tender asses. Just the littlest tickle, and we got to scratch it. He says, I must scratch. There again, this idea that the brain has a problem. It's got to find out. A pro, uh, an answer to that problem. Otherwise, it's going to be in pain. I must scratch. So again, so on the one hand, this is an interesting scene, isn't it? On the one hand, we have bottom and the frail, the suggestion of how, 
frail as ego is. On the other hand, he's behaving rather tyrannical, isn't he? He's been given a little bit of power now, and he's ordering all these fairies around. Do this for me, do that for me, go there, fetch this, fetch that. They're fetching the jewels of the deep. Here, here are the jewels of the deep, of course. Uh, the irony is the jewel is the, the scratch. Ooh. Yeah, well, if you've got a really bad itch, that can be better than any diamond. I mean, you can have all the diamonds in the world, but if you've got a really bad itch, yeah, you can give all those diamonds away just to satisfy, just to scratch that itch. You know how horrible it is when you can't, I mean, I broke my, my arm when I was little, and oh, you can't reach where you, you know, where you got the itch inside. That's just maddening, absolutely maddening. So this is the jewel of a deeper bottom, these, uh, you know. And of course, he's got the head of a jackass, so he wants to feed, you know. So, uh, yeah, these are the jewels of the deep, the irony in that, uh, you know, when Titania said in the last uh, act that she would have her fairies fetch, notice she'll have her fairies do it, they'll do all the work. She'll have her fairies fetch for bottom the jewels from the deep. And we imagine all kinds of uh, 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 unattainable uh, riches, you know, that most humans can't get their hands on. But this is what bottom wants. Um, yeah, when our basic needs are met, we'll sell off whatever we need to to have them met. They must be scratched. Um, but yes, bottom becomes a kind of tyrant here, doesn't he? And again, I would say because for the first time, he is feeling important. Uh, you know, and he has this enormous ego, and underneath we see the fear, that anxiety, that uh, he's worthless and doesn't. Uh, of course, he's not aware of this, of course. But um, this is what we see. But look what Titania says. Again, Titania's in a different play. This, she's in another film here. Look, she's trying to turn his attention back to love. What, will thou hear some music, my sweet love? And of course, music, again, one of those uh, 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 props of romantic love. I just mentioned the background music in uh, uh, romantic films. So she's calling for music. You know, music is the food of love, as Shakespeare says in another play. Uh, he has one of his characters say in another play, Duke Orsino, music is the food of love. I mean, it sets the mood. You know, you're in your, your bachelor pad and a potential uh, uh, sweetie pie's coming over. You turn on that music, you set the mood. You want to get things just right. Because uh, you got to satisfy that that sexual frustration. That's what Titania's trying to do here. She's in pain. She's in pain. <laughs> and uh, she says, let's have some music, my sweet love. And Bottom says, look what he says uh, to her response here. I have a reasonable good ear in music. Let's have the tongs and the bones. So he wants the triangles that clank, 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 and the bones that clank, clank, clunk, clunk, clank, clank, clunk, clunk. Uh, this is not the kind of music to set the mood, is it? And so Titania, you know, she's got to think. She's got to think on her fairy feet here. She says, oh, or say, sweet love, uh, what thou desires to eat. So, uh, you know, again, this idea of eating and uh, many romantics believe there are some foods, they call them aphrodisiacs, and these foods, of course, uh, they uh, stimulate one's sec uh, sexual desires, one's sexual longings, like uh, in the film of Tess of the Duberville's, you know, the big, big, juicy strawberries, and of course, covered in chocolate's even better. You know, there, there are these foods that people imagine will, you know, one appetite will lead to another appetite. Um, yeah, that reminds me of um, the novel Tom Jones, and particularly the film uh, uh, version, the film adaptation of the novel with uh, Albert Finney, and of course the famous scene in, in, in uh, uh, that film and in the book when Tom uh, rescues Mrs. Waters on the road, a woman that she, he's just met, and uh, they hole up in the inn at night. They sit down to this scrumptious, delicious five-course meal, and they begin eating. And as they do, they begin, you know, to 
eat in this very sexually suggestive way and they begin licking their fingers and you know their lips with their tongue and the camera zooms in on their eyes and they're each giving uh, the other uh, uh, Google eyes you know you can see you know, this very close association with sex and food the sexual appetite uh, you know people hunger for sex oh and that reminds me yeah I, uh, I wanted to see if I could find more of, you know, something you might be familiar with. I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, singer named Boa, but I went online to see if I could find this connection, this link between food and sex, uh, to see if I could find it, maybe some, some uh, popular music today. Not that, uh, I'm, you know, I'm assuming that you listen to this kind of music, but nevertheless. And this is a, yeah, I found this song, these lyrics by Boa. Uh, listen to these lyrics and you can see this connection between food and sex. And remember, Titania said, would you like something to eat? That's very suggestive, isn't it? I, don't, I imagine in Shakespeare's day, this idea of eating, you know, she's not here referring to, would you like to eat some food, is she? Would you like something to eat, my love? And here we have, uh, here the first verse, when I first saw you, I knew nothing like it used to be. Boy, you have got to be the finest thing in history. The way I feel inside is just so hard to understand. You feed my appetite in ways I can't explain. If you move any closer, boy, this is the second verse. If you move any closer, boy, there is no guarantee what I will do to you. I fear it, and it's scaring me. Here again, the ego, the sexual desire, out of control, like I've become some demon in the night. Some demon in the night. Uh, you know, possessed by a demon to do all kinds, wreak all kinds of horrors and uh, harms. <clears throat> you look so tasty. I could eat you up alive. And then the uh, chorus comes in. I want to take you to my room. I eat you up. I want to take you to my room. Whoa, I eat you up. Whoa, so yum, yum. Whoa, can't get enough. Whoa, oh, oh, I think I'm in love. The irony there, I think I'm in love. This is not love, is it? I eat you up, I eat you up. I eat you up, I eat you up. I eat you up, I'll eat you up. I'll eat you up. <gasps> poetry. <laughs> True poetry. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, she turns to him. There's this very close association here. We can see her sexual appetite under the influence, what thou desires to eat, she wants to know. And again, bottom, <laughs> he's, uh, you know, in another book, another play, look what he says. Um, Truly a peck of provender. I could munch your good dry oats. Methinks I have a great desire to a bottle of hay. Good hay, sweet hay, hath no fellow. He wants hay. I mean, uh, I'm thinking of that movie that came out a few years back. Uh, yeah, she uh, is in this film called Fifty Shades of Grey. I mean, she's ready to get the whips and the chains out. She's already, get, you know, and uh, all kinds of, you know, engage in all kinds of uh, sexual perversities uh, because she just, as I said, uh, she just got to have that ass. That's just the way she's just driven. But Bottom isn't in this film, Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, his movie's called Fifty Shades of Hay. Not gray, Fifty Shades of Hay. <laughs> and so they're just not going to, uh, uh, you know, they're not, uh, they're just not, what, they, what their brains are desiring are not uh, connecting here. And this again under, undermines this romantic view, you know, this that you're drawn 
sexually, physically, and spiritually toward one another. And Shakespeare's saying no. In this case, bottom no. He really seems, doesn't he, as if he, um, he, he don't know that much about sex. It doesn't seem, I mean, I, I'm only speculating here again, but it sounds as if he may be a virgin. And he just doesn't, you know, I don't think they had uh, a high school in Shakespeare's day or in ancient Greek. I don't think they, you know, had uh, uh, health class, you know, uh, and where they were introduced to sex and, you know, and uh, uh, sex education. I don't think they had that back then. So I don't know how much Bottom knows about sex. He seems to be in the dark, rather, and he doesn't seem to be aware <laughs> that uh, uh, what Titania wants here. Uh, I don't, you know, I, again, it's interesting here um, that Bottom, remember I said last time that Bottom's ego is always causing him, he's a naysayer, you know, and that's why he's been changed, one of the reasons why he's been changed into a, a, a jackass, a mule, is because he can nay. And here, again, he's naysaying, but uh, in, a, in a way that he's not aware, I would say, because he just doesn't seem to get it, does it? what uh, Titania wants. Fifty Shades of Grey, he wants Fifty Shades of Hay. Well, that's a good title. You know, you could, for your essay, uh, this is, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but if you feel like this play is just, oh, as I'm feeling over the course of these lectures, just too much to talk about, well, look at one particular scene. Zero in, topic B, look at one scene in the play and analyze it the way I'm doing here in this scene. Look at this scene if you'd like. Uh, look at this scene and analyze the scene and ask yourself what ideas in this scene are being uh, uh, presented? What does the play say about uh, this sacred notion of romantic love and romantic sex? Because again, I'm arguing that it's just having, you know, it's parodying, it's ridic ridiculing, it's mocking, it's making fun of of the notion of a sacred bond between spirits and, a, uh, and it somehow that that, believe, you know, that from that emerges this really great sex, you know, as we're all told. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, look at one scene, zero and in one scene if you feel like, uh, you know, that's all you can chew now that we're on the topic of eating. If that's all, you know, you don't want to, bite off more than you could chew. So yeah, just look at one particular scene. Pick out your favorite scene in the play and analyze it in depth. And go through it and point out the ironies and the metaphors and the similes and the ideas. And get in your, get in your mind what, what, you'd like, what you think this scene is saying about romantic love. But at any rate, we return here. So yeah, this is a competition of egos uh, bottom wanting one thing, Titania wanting another, uh, but it isn't this, uh, they're not playing a sexual game here. It's not as if she, you know, the competition of egos in the bedroom, she can't even, you know, get his mind on the bedroom here. Um, so it's not uh, to see who, who dominates, uh, you know, who, who will ultimately dominate sexually, because the realist, you know, Again, this idea that lovers want to please each other sexually. Uh, yeah, well, you know, just imagine pleasing someone else's needs and not having your needs met sexually. You can see that uh, the ego, the sexual drive, the sexual need is a very powerful thing. It needs to be fed. Feed me, feed me, see more. Um, but this always reminds me, I made a little note here. I was thinking uh, when I read this, uh, Reread this last night. I was thinking of the movie The Thomas Crown Affair, where Steve McQueen and Faye Dunaway, you know, he's the thief and she's the insurance agent and she's trying to track down the thief. Um, and that, again, that very famous scene in that film where they are playing a game of chess. But they're not really playing a game of chess. The director, he's, what's he, what he wants to show is they're playing the game of sex. Uh, because the way she caresses the chess pieces on the board and the way he looks deeply into her eyes and gives her that little wicked smile. I watched this scene from the film. 
and the camera zeroes in so that we can see, you know, and of course, uh, that we look into their eyes. We get very close shots of their eyes. And so they're really, what they are is playing a kind, it's a kind of courtship, isn't it? But it isn't a courtship of romantic love. They're not looking, you know, they're not seeing in, in the other, oh, what, a, what a person of character you are. You know, after all, he's a thief and she works for an insurance company. So, come on. But at any rate, you know, it's not that, oh, I'm drawn to you because you're a person of uh, probity and sincerity and character and integrity. No, I'm attracted to you sexually. And so the, this game of chess, it's not a, which we normally associate with a game of reason, uh, that idea is being subverted again. This is now has become a game of sexual desire and uh, sexual foreplay, not a game of reason. I mean, they've only just met. <laughs> what could they possibly know of each other? But at any rate, Bottom wants that hay, Fifty Shades of Hay, and so Titania does it, you know, Titania has a fair, but she doesn't, uh, look what she says, which is interesting. She says, I have a venturous fairy that shall seek the squirrel's hoard and fetch thee off new nuts. <laughs> and again, come on, Shakespeare's got to be putting on this idea. What you need are some new nuts. That's what you need, Bottom. Uh, so Shakespeare, again, a sexual pun. Shakespeare, is, he loves these sexual puns. We'll see that again in Act 5, uh, in the play within the play, Pyramus and Thisbe. So always be on the lookout, because Shakespeare likes to pun. He likes to mock this idea of romance and wants to keep telling us, no, it isn't. It's sex. It's ego. It's how you were brought up. You were brought up to believe it's love. But she says, what you need, baby, are some new nuts. And look what Bottom's response is. Shakespeare's going to continue the puns here. I had rather have a handful of two, uh, a handful or two dried peas. I had rather have a handful or two dried peas. And again, you know, you can imagine the sexual pun here. Bottom just not interested sexually. And uh, we know where the uh, sexual hormones are produced in the testicles. And so uh, his testicles here, what he prefers, he doesn't want two new nuts. What he wants are two dried peas, two little shriveled up, dried up peas. Uh, and again, it underscores this idea, maybe Bottom's asexual. You know, I've always, I've never thought of that. Maybe, uh, you know, there are some people who just don't have that interest. Uh, I've always thought that he's a virgin and he's just clueless, you know, he's never, he never attended sex education class in high school, so he just doesn't know what's going on. But uh, maybe he's asexual. And A, again, the Greek prefix meaning without. He's just without any sexual desire. Uh, his two little dried peas, they're just not producing those hormones that, uh, you know, cause the rest of us to go mad <laughs> and insane uh, uh, and to pursue whatever we want with the soul of love. You notice the irony in that expression, the soul of love. No, that's the beast. The soul of love is the animal, the beast within us. But anyway, that's what Bottom wants, two dried peas. Um, but then look where his attention turns next. I mean, he's really, he's uh, completely, as I said earlier, disinterested. He said, but I pray you, let none of your people stir me. I have an exposition of sleep come upon me. So Bottom wants now to go to sleep. I mean, you know, he's, he's uh, had his fill. He's, had his, he's been scratched, he's had his itches scratched. He doesn't have any uh, other itches to be scratched like Titania. Um, you know, she's itching all over. But not Vonham, you know, he's satisfied. He's ready for bed now, he's ready to go to sleep. And normally, of course, we think of sleep as following the sexual act, but Bottom here wants to sleep before. Of course, as I said again, I don't think he realizes what Titania wants, but he's ready for sleep now. His animal needs have been met. He's filled his belly. He's had, he's had his uh, hairy head scratched. And uh, now he's ready to go to sleep. Um, and so Titania, again, uh, she jumps at this, doesn't she? Doesn't she? He's ready to go to sleep. Uh, because, again, in her mind, sleep, bed, ah, 
this is what my lover wants. All right, finally at last. You know, let's go to bed then. So look what she says. Sleep now, and I will wind thee in my arms. And then she tells her fairies to be gone. She wants, uh, she wants everybody away. She wants the, uh, her privacy. She wants to be with Bottom all by herself. Look what she says. Fairies, be gone, and be always away. Be away in all different directions. I don't want nobody near us. <laughs> she wants her privacy and her bower and her boudoir there. And then, of course, the question becomes, here at this point, um, do Bottom and Titania have sex? Big question. Uh, critics have looked at this question. Uh, if you've watched several film adaptations of the play, you know, some directors give us the G-rated version where Titania and Bottom sit to cuddle up together. And that's all they do. So you have the G-rated version, you know, the version for children. And then, of course, you have the X-rated version, the version for adults. And I've seen a couple of performances live on stage with the X-rated version. Uh, it's quite, uh, you know, can be quite entertaining, uh, much more so than the uh, G-rated version. But um, do they engage in sex? That's the question here, isn't it? Um, Look what Titania says next, now that they are alone. All the fairies have exited the stage, and she says at the bottom of the page, So doth the woodbine, the sweet honeysuckle, gently entwist. The female ivy so rings the barky fingers of the elm. Oh, how I love thee, how I dote on thee. And of course, I've just read you the G-rated version where she's simply cuddling in his arms, and you get this image here. Shakespeare gives us two metaphors here in these lines. Um, the woodbine uh, gently entwisting the sweet honeysuckle, bottom, of course, being the sweet honeysuckle. Uh, and uh, we know earlier that bottom had called for honey. He's interested in, you know, the honey that the bees make here, but uh, this honeysuckle is the honey that comes from the flower. Keep that in mind. And then we get the second metaphor here. So the first metaphor, we have the, the uh, uh, woodbine, uh, and of course, Titania is a fairy of the woods, and the sweet honeysuckle is being gently entwisted by the woodbine, so you can imagine her arms, uh, you know, as she, moves in and snuggles with bottom and they embrace. And then the second metaphor comes, the female ivy so in rings the barky fingers of the elm. So again, you imagine her cuddling, you know, snuggling up, getting closer. And then she whispers in his ears, oh, how I love thee, how I dote on thee. And you get the exclamation at the point, and they drift off to sleep. So that's the G-rated version. I would say that's the weakest of all the versions <laughs> because we've seen up to this moment, uh, I can't imagine that to Tanya. I mean, yes, yeah, she's serving her love, his needs come first, but remember the realist is gonna say, no, it's not about uh, honey bunny's needs coming first. The ego says, I want my needs met. I don't wanna have to scrub that toilet. You scrub that toilet. <laughs> So, yeah, it's about my needs being met before Honey Bunny's needs being met. I mean, romantics may say, yes, darling, you come first, precious angel. You always before me. But in reality, no. So I would imagine that Titania here, we've seen her sexual frustration and her longing. And uh, this animal come out in her. She, her identity is completely changed here under the influence of these uh, sex chemicals, these sex hormones. The juice, right? Her brain, it's like a, you know, the blender, the juice blender. That blender's turned on full speed. That juice is going around in the blender. <sighs> you just got to taste that juice. Uh, but um, here, then, of course, you could reread this with the X-rated version. 
And uh, that makes for a more interesting production, much funnier. So she says, let's go back to page 1377. She says, sleep now and I will wind thee in my arms. Fairies, be gone and be always away. You can hear that anxious, the eagerness in her voice. Get out of here. Find me, I got him in bed. And she says, so doth the woodbine, the sweet honeysuckle, gently and twist. And now what happens? Now this metaphor becomes a sexual metaphor. It's a sexual image, isn't it? We have the image of the uh, uh, woodbine that is now gently and twisting the sweet honeysuckle. So remember, Titania is uh, representing here the woodbine and bottom the sweet honeysuckle wants to be sucked out of that sweet flower. Uh, 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 so the woodbine becomes the vagina and it enrings the sweet honeysuckle flower which becomes the penis and the sweet honeysuckle becomes the semen uh, that she wishes to, you know, uh, suck out of that sweet flower. And again, the, the image of the flower is suggesting that Bottom, uh, you know, he, he just doesn't understand. Uh, he's just, once again, he lacks the knowledge uh, because we have this image, uh, this traditional understanding, the image of the flower as representative of virginity. It's symbolic of a, a, a woman's virginity. But here again, we have the inversion, don't we? It's Bottom who's the virgin here. I mean, after all, Titania, she's a, an eternal fairy, so and she's been, I guess she's been forever with her king, Oberon, so I imagine she, she ain't no virgin. I imagine she's got plenty of experience. After all, remember, she told Bottom, you know, that she's going to purge his mortal grossness so that he shall, like an airy spirit, grow. So she obviously knows her way around the bedroom. And um, she's had plenty of practice, plenty of experience. So she's the scientist <laughs> when it comes to sex. Uh, she could write a book on it as long as she's been around. But then if you don't understand the first sexual metaphor here, the first sexual image, Shakespeare... He's not going, you know, he's, for those in the audience who just missed it, like, like Bottoms Unaware too. Shakespeare's going to repeat it. And this time, it's going to be even clearer. The, the metaphor is going to become more pronounced. It's going to become sharper, if you will. Instead of the woodbine and the honeysuckle, look at the second metaphor, the female ivy. Again, now it's the female ivy. Shakespeare's alerting to us just what the female ivy represents. And again, it's going to enring the barky fingers of the elm. And of course, the barky fingers. Uh, again, we have this image of the vagina and the penis and the uh, female ivy that enrings the barky fingers of the elm. And then there's this dash mark. Uh, you know, Shakespeare's very careful with his punctuation. After all, he's a poet. Every little mark is important to Shakespeare. So the dash mark suggests that Titania is bottom. I imagine bottom's drifting off to sleep at this point. But that Titania is actually mounting at this point, bottom. And, uh, I mean, it can be humorous, but we've got to remember that bottom is, in a sense... You know, it, this, this argument here, he's, he is in a sense, he's certainly not giving her his consent. So this can be, really be an ugly, dark moment, can't it? This idea that, that what this is, is, although it might, you know, I, we talked last time about the various degrees of rape, the various type, uh, you know, degrees of brutality and rape, and some rapes are just horrifically vicious and brutal and can end in murder, but others don't. I mean, it's just a fact that um, some rapes, physically speaking, I mean rape, okay, don't misunderstand me, rape, wrong, but that some rapes, factually speaking, are not as violent as other rapes. This rape doesn't appear to be violent, but it is a rape, if you're going to think about this. Uh, because of her sexual desires, because of her sexual needs, um, and she is the fairy with the force, 
she has assumed the role of the dominatrix here. Who, you know, this is her upsetting the patriarchal order. This is not a case of where the man is having his mayor. Um, but it's, uh, uh, it's inverted here. She is the one in control here. And it is, if you will, a rape. So we've got to keep in mind that underneath this fun that's going on, uh, particularly as it's performed on stage and in film many times, because the next line, I mean, she cries out, Oh, how I love thee! How I, uh, I, uh, 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 dote on thee! I mean, you can hear Shakespeare, uh, he wants these words to be interpreted as the uh, orgasmic moment. This is her climaxing here, sexually, the sexual climactic moment for her. I'm always reminded of this film, Harry Met Sally, where, uh, you know, uh, this young couple, and they, they're, they're always spurring with one another, and they're sitting in a restaurant, and uh, 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 Sally tells Harry that, you know, women aren't as great a lovers as they think they are. You know, we, we women, we have to fake it all the time. And Harry says, oh, no, 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 that can't be, you know. Uh, none of the women I've ever been with fake, fake it. She says, oh, you'd be surprised. He says, oh, no, I'd know in a heartbeat if it was fake or not. And so she, right there in the middle of the restaurant, uh, you've got to watch this film if you haven't seen see it, when Harry met Sally, right then to prove her point, this contest of egos again, between, right, Harry and Sally, to prove her point, you know, Harry says, oh, no, I'd recognize in a heartbeat. I'd know for certain if my, the partner I was with in bed was, if she, if she was faking is she faking an orgasm? I'd know. I'd know. I could read her mind. You know, the romantic in him. And the realist in uh, Sally comes out, doesn't she? says, she stands back. And then she goes, oh, 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 oh. And she, I mean, she gives a really good performance, an Oscar-worthy performance. Uh, uh, the method actor comes out here, and she actually, uh, it appears as if she is experiencing an orgasm. This actor, uh, who was the actor who played this role? I think it was Meg Ryan, don't quote me on that. But yeah, I mean, Meg Ryan is a method actor. So remember, method actors, they aren't classically trained. Classical actors are trained to speak the lines and to pretend, to pretend they're crying. But they're not really feeling the emotion that comes with crying. I mean, it can look as if they're crying, but they're not trained to actually feel that emotion. Whereas method actors, the school of method acting, that, you know, begins uh, in the middle of uh, the 19th century. And of course, Marlon Brando being one of the great method actors of all time, he sort of like uh, begins this movement toward method acting. It's the idea that actors don't, uh, uh, they, uh, many times they don't even learn the lines very well, but they inhabit the character they're playing. They actually live the lives of that character. They become that character. So they want to get uh, understand that character from a psychological, uh, uh, they want a psychological understanding of that character. And so they spend weeks in preparation becoming that character so that when they do feel the emotion, when they are crying on screen or, or, or on the stage, they're not pretending. I mean, they have reached that moment, which I guess would be the climactic moment in acting, wouldn't it? The orgasmic moment for an actor, if you will. They have reached that moment where they are no longer acting. I mean, the, the ultimate goal of the actor is to not appear as if he's acting. It's real. Which is why so many actors have trouble with Shakespeare. I mean, the language gets in the way. It's kind of hard to feel when you're reading this poetry, this poetic, this lyrical language, uh, very few actors can pull off Shakespeare. That's why I'm not particularly appreciative of, I, I, I don't particularly care to watch adaptations of the play, because it's much more real in my imagination when I'm reading it. But yeah, I mean, Meg Ryan in that scene, yeah, I think her name was Meg Ryan, that's right, it's coming back. She actually experienced the orgasm right before it was on the stage, and, and there's a woman, an elderly woman sitting at the table, Everybody in the restaurant, you know, they all stop eating. Their, their mouths drop to the floor, and all the silverware, you know, all the waitresses drop their trays, and all the silverware clanks, clinks, and clanks, and everybody stops and listens. 
and it watches Meg Ryan experience an orgasm in the middle of the center of the restaurant, and the elderly lady sitting at the table next door turns to the waitress after Meg Ryan goes, ah! and the elderly lady says, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> so it's a great moment in the film. So yeah, I mean, I would say of these two interpretations, certainly the one that is, uh, uh, that's playing for laughs is uh, uh, the uh, sexual, um, the, the, the X-rated version. Because remember, we're in a comedy, so it's going to be played for laughs. It's not going to be played as if you're in a romance where, again, uh, that can undermine this idea of romance. This isn't going to be played seriously in a romantic comedy. So it does bring the audience, you know, I've sat in both types of performances in the audience in the X-rated version. I mean, they're the ones uh, hee-hawing. Uh, I don't know what's going on with Bottom. It may be the Bottom sound asleep here at this point. Uh, it could be, or he could just be stunned and, you know, <laughs> it could be that he just don't know what's going on. But so the second version, but I would argue ultimately, and I've never, uh, you know, critics will debate this point, but I've never come across a critic who says, well, there's a third interpretation here, and that's the third interpretation that Shakespeare's actually going for. I mean, don't misunderstand me. I'm sure in Shakespeare's day, Shakespeare's day, I'm sure on the stage, they went for the X-rated version. And the language reveals this, the sexual metaphors, and we know the, the, the conventional symbols here, the flower, um, and so forth. But there is a third interpretation, and that is that uh, what's going on, what's happening with Titania, is that she's experiencing the orgasm imaginatively. It's a head game. It's a head game. And whether you play it that they're just cuddling, which I think is the weakest interpretation because that's not going to reveal that sex is a head game. It's not this romantic notion that you see in films, and maybe you've seen your fill of these films, where the two lovers, they do, a mutual together, focus on one another, looking to, into each other's eyes, and they, you know, this orgasmic moment, and it's always, as I said earlier, it's always a mutual orgasm of the experience together. That's the union, union of body and mind. Remember, uh, romantics believe not only in the body, but in the mind, in the soul, something non-physical, something that makes human beings unique and sets them apart. And Shakespeare's saying, no, it's a head game, this uh, uh, sexual fan, the sexual fantasies that we see portrayed in films, that's not the reality. Because sex is really a head game. It's happening in each of the individual's heads. And many times that individual isn't even in in his or her mind isn't even in bed with uh, the honey bunny. <laughs> They're in bed, as I said earlier, with, I don't know, Angelina Jolie or Brad Pitt. Sometimes people even call out somebody else's name at that moment of uh, uh, sexual climax. It is a head game. It is a fantasy game. Um, and Shakespeare's... Uh, so it isn't, ultimately, it doesn't really matter which of these two versions it is, because through the metaphors that Shakespeare's using, we know what's going on in Titania's head. This is what's going on in her head, this, uh, this union between her and Bottom. And it is sexual, purely sexual. And it is this fantasy the realist would say is where uh, a good sex is ultimately to be found. You know, Shakespeare may have finally found a solution here in the play. I never thought about it before. But if it is a head game, if you can manage to play that game by yourself and not have to involve somebody else, not have to bring somebody else into your game, you know, the ego, it can be all about you and your sexual desires. If you've got great enough imagination, well, maybe you can win this game of love. And maybe, I mean, this would be interesting, maybe uh, the path toward winning the game of love is masturbation. Because the masturbatory act, nobody need be around. And you have all the liberty and uh, all, all, 
play you know magic any fantasy that you wish and you know you can uh, your imagination the greater your imagination the greater the fantasy and you can bring in all your props and whatever it is you might what might imagine uh, you can do it in your head you don't even have to bring in the props literally you can do it all in your imagination and uh that, that too underscores, I think, another problem in this play that you could explore in your film, and that is the problem of sex. Uh, remember, sex comes with love for most people, and there is a problem when it comes to sex because it isn't this romantic view that sex is, you know, cool between two people, and it always works out. It's always, you know, this ideal union that people fantasize about. But in reality, no, um, particularly in the early stages when you don't know much about the other person physically and there's always this anxiety underneath because remember that ego's going to kick in. You want to be, you want to be perceived, you don't want to be seen as a terrible lover. You want to be seen as this fabulous lover, this unimagined, this Don Juan. I mean, you know, you want to be the Prince Charming. You want to be the Cinderella. You want your partner to find you, your sexual skills. Remember, Theseus on the military field, his military prowess and, and Paula, oh, well, what is that an indication of? Maybe that too is his sexual uh, capabilities, his military strength. And for men, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons of their egos. It feeds their egos, their military skill on the battlefield is parallel to their skill in the bedroom, the kind of soldier in the bedroom, if you will, going into battle to prove that, yes, you can woo that baby with your sword. Remember uh, Theseus' line, I wooed thee with my sword. Well, he showed her on the battlefield that he can woo her with his sword. Many critics say that he suggests that he raped her, but I don't think so. Um, uh, that kind of spoils this idea. Now he's going to show her, because he hasn't, he hasn't consummated, uh, you know, they aren't married. He hasn't consummated the relationship. And that's why he's so eager at the beginning of the play. But now he's going to show her his sword in the bedroom rather than the battlefield. Well, there's a good title for your play, The Sword in the Bedroom. You could focus on men, the male ego in this play, and their need to dominate over women to show that they are the military heroes, <laughs> you know, on the battleground of sex, the, the bedroom the master bedroom, the king-size bed. So, yeah, um, I've lost my train of thought now. But at any rate, uh, yeah, the romantic, uh, the rea reality of sex is that the body gets in the way of the fantasy. And so particularly if you don't know anything about your partner, you want to be perceived as a great lover, and now you've got to worry, well, how do I touch my partner? What does he like? What does she like? Uh, you know, and then your partner's worrying about the same thing, and then there's the problem of, well, you're not touching me quite the way I like to be touched. You know, oh, watch that, that hurts. But then there's the problem, you don't want to hurt your honey buddy's ego, you don't want to say anything. <laughs> you know, so it can really, the body, the body, the physicality of sex can just drag the fantasy into the dirt. I mean, it can tie it. I mean, you know, the fantasy of sex is you're cruising down the highway in your Corvette, but, you know, the reality is you can find yourself tied to the, the, the fender in the back of that Corvette, and you could be dragged down that highway, and you could end up bloody and beaten and just defeated completely. I mean, we know of the problems uh, that, uh, you know, in our society that many men have the anxiety, you know, and they have to take drugs, uh, you know, so uh, to, uh, I'm not, I mean, I'm not making fun of that problem. I'm sure it's painful, but I, it is back to this idea of the ego, isn't it? Um, and then the, in addition to this problem of the body and not knowing exactly, you know, you're much more familiar with your own body than you are with somebody else's body. You know what feels right. You know what feels wrong. We know what is painful. You know what uh, alleviates that pain, what we call a genuine pleasure, but um, what the romantic calls that. But then there are also the consequences of sex. Children. That's a big consequence. And particularly if you don't want children. 
I mean, in Shakespeare's day, that's a big problem because they didn't have the kinds of, you know, they didn't have prophylactics. You couldn't go down to Walgreens and buy yourself the Trojan condoms. So, you know, women, you know, they, before they were 30, they'd already had seven, eight, nine, ten children. And as I said, it was either the first baby that killed them or the last baby that killed them. Um, many, many women died in childbirth. And then the ch children, the, the mortality rate. Uh, you gonna watch several of your children die if you're living in Shakespeare's day. Uh, I don't think many people today would want to have children if they knew that they're gonna have to watch half of them die. One of Shakespeare's own children, his son, his only son died. Uh, the plague guy. So yeah, there's this problem of children, isn't there? And children can kind of spoil a romance too, can't, can't they? I mean, it's no longer just the two of you now, it's the three of you, and the dynamics and the relationship change. And uh, as we've seen in this play between Titania and Oberon, the little changeling boy, he's changed the dynamic in the relationship. Oberon is jealous of Titania's attentions to the little changeling child. I mean, that's why he's seeking revenge not because he believes she's been stepping out on him, but because she's turned all her attention away from him because she knows he's been stepping out on her. So they're each retaliating against the other, but the introduction of this child, children can be a problem uh, uh, for the romantic. And we know, we see also, remember, Shakespeare has the votaress, uh, 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 Titania's worshiper, die off stage during childbirth. And this little boy is orphaned. Shakespeare's day, you know, children were orphaned. Uh, and look at uh, the parents who are going to raise this child, Oberon and Titania. I don't know about you, but if I were a child, I wouldn't want those two people for my parents, not with their egos. Uh, they're just so focused on themselves. And they only want me, they each only want me because I'm being used as a, you know, a tool, a weapon, so that they can uh, defeat the other. I'm just a means toward their end. So yeah, if I were a baby, if I were that little changing boy, I would want to be there. I would want them for my mom and daddy. A lot of parents are like that. You know, they use, they can use children as a kind of weapon to come between. Uh, you know, to to assert their authority over their their romantic partner. So children, a big problem, a consequence of sex. It's not, you know, uh, as we'll see in the last act, uh, we'll see the romantic view of having children, but it's Shakespeare again is going to save that biggest problem for last. And we'll see that in the fairy blessing in Act 5, the problem of procreation and of having children. But remember, there's also sex, sexual disease that comes from sex. Uh, and it's mentioned in this play, of course, uh, we're reminded, let's turn back just briefly to Act 1. Uh, don't panic, I'm not going all the way up to Act 1 for very long, but turn back to Act 1, uh, uh, Scene 2, the very end of Scene 2, and uh, I'm on page, uh, where am I? Yes, Act 5, Scene 2, on page 1, 3, 4, 7, halfway down the page, line uh, 73 or so. So the problem of sexual disease, that too is a consequence of sex. And we're reminded at the very beginning of the play, remember Theseus, he wants to pass the time quickly, the days quickly. So he says, let's party. Call up the Athenian, you know, let's call all the, the young uh, uh, men and women and boys and girls of Athens and let's party, baby. Let's celebrate. We have only four days to our marriage. And you can imagine, we're in ancient Greece, of course, you can imagine that wine's going to flow. That wine's going to flow. It's going to overflow. And these young people, they're going to be booging and partying like the nightclubs on the weekends. And remember the, the, the nightclubs, what happens at these clubs? Uh, they get the lights down low. Anything can happen in the dark. The animal's much more likely to come out than the night in the dark. And then they get you looking up. And so your personal identity changes, doesn't it? It's now you're some other, you're some other person you wouldn't recognize when you're sober. And they get you looking up. And then they, you know, they turn the music up and the music, the background, and it's the boom, 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 
boom, boom, boom. You get that kind of, you know. It's, it's the, the, uh, uh, the, the sexual act, it's the beat, the heartbeat. Right? It's the sexual act, boom, 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 boom. You can hear it in the background. And, you know, it gets hot, and that song is getting hot in here, let's take off all our clothes. I mean, uh, hear these Athenian youths, we can imagine that uh, the majority of them most likely are going to engage in sex. And uh, there are going to be consequences. Turn here to Act 2, Scene 1, and Shakespeare, remember, this play is always taking a dark turn. I'm arguing that it's a realistic tragedy, not a romantic comedy, because Shakespeare is so, always showing us the underbelly, the, 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 uh, you know, the horrors beneath the, you know, this, this, uh, the horrors b behind the, uh, uh, what's, what's that, the canopy, the curtains on the canopy of the bed, the bedroom, there's the horrors there behind that canopy, behind the curtains uh, uh, surrounding that, the bed in the bedroom. And look what happens here. Uh, uh, Quince has fooled Bottom into playing the role of the lover. Quince, remember, he said, oh, you're, you have to play the lover, Bottom, because Bottom wants to play all the roles, his ego, he wants to play every part. But Quinn says, you have to play the lover. The lover is so handsome. He's so good looking. And you're the only one who can play that part. So Bottom has agreed to play the lover. And so lovers have beards. And he wants to know, Bottom wants to know what color beard he should wear. And Bottom goes through the whole list. You know, Bottom likes to create the problem and then resolve the problem. Uh, he wants, again, that's his ego. He likes to create an imaginary problem and then create it and impress everyone around him. And uh, he wonders what beard he should play it in. And uh, Quint says, well, whatever beard you, you desire, Bottom, you're the boss, you're the boss, Applesauce. You decide. And look what Bottom says here at line 74 or 76 or 7 here. I will discharge it in either your straw-colored beard, your orange tawny beard, your purple ingrain beard, or hmm, your French crown color beard, your perfect yellow. And that first word at the top of his speech here, that word discharge, and Bottom's uh, one of those people who uses the wrong word. Uh, he means, uh, uh, I, I will perform, and he's using, using the word discharge for the word perform here. Uh, but discharge, of course, there again is a sexual pun. And Shakespeare's reminding us of the penis and the discharge that comes from the penis, the semen, and so Shakespeare's alerting us here at the top of the speech. Something here, a point he wishes to make. And the last colored beard that Bottom talks about is the French crown color beard. The French crown, the gold coin. Um, that's the color of gold. The French crown colored beard. And uh, Quince, look what Quince says. It's up to Quince to make the sexual joke. Because again, I would say Bottom just, he can't make a sexual joke openly. He just doesn't have any idea. Just doesn't know enough about sex. And Quinn says, some of your French crowns have no hair at all. And then you will play barefaced. And you see here, down here in your footnote, this says uh, that this is uh, a reference to the sexual disease uh, syphilis. And that, uh, of course, you catch this disease, and the first thing, the first thing that alerts you is that the hair all over your body, everywhere on your body, drops out, falls off. And you have absolutely no hair at all. That includes the beard on your face. He says, you'll play it bare-faced. And, of course, it's the French color crown, because, you know, the English and the French, they, their egos, they were always competing against each other. And so the disease, of course, it's the French who brought the disease to England and gave it to the English. It's those, you know, the evil forces, the evil French forces in the battle, you know, where the good, the English, the good forces will triumph in the end. You know, these are romantics. They're just everywhere. Um, but yeah, that was the first uh, uh, consequence of uh, catching this disease. And then what happens next is the disease eats away the cartilage on your face. And it takes a long time to die. And it's, you can imagine that this disease eating away your ears and eating away your lips, your eyelids, and your, the cartilage on your nose. I mean, you begin to look, you 
begin to see the skull beneath the skin. I mean, it's, uh, the symbol has become symbolic of a reminder of one's mortality. In Hamlet, we'll see this idea of Hamlet's one of those beings who, because of what's happened in the play, he's one of those few people who, when he looks at the human face, he can see the skull beneath the skin. And syphilis then becomes symbolic of this idea of mortality, of death. Remember Lysander, war, death, sickness, they lay siege like an army that surrounds the fortress of true love. They lay siege to true love and conquer it. True love does not conquer all. And here we have this image of syphilis eating away. And it's come from sex, the sexual act. The reality of the sexual act, not this romantic notion that people have of the sexual act. And many people today, still today, uh, uh, they will engage in sex without a prophylactic, without protection. Now, true, we don't have syphilis anymore. I mean, you catch syphilis today, you still catch it, but you go to your local health clinic and penicillin, clear it up. It still won't be that painful, of course, but it's going to clear it up. Gonorrhea as well. But in Shakespeare's day, there, there was no cure for, for syphilis, gonorrhea. So these people died slowly and painfully. And then again today, we're reminded, well, we have herpes. And we have AIDS. And many people still don't take precautions. They're romantics in the imagination. It's not going to happen to me. That happens to other people, not to me. It can't happen to me, I'm special. I'm important, I'm too important to catch AIDS or herpes. Not gonna happen to me. So, um, yeah, Shakespeare, this would make an interesting topic for your essay if you'd like to write, instead of love in a Midsummer Night's Dream, you could write on sex in a Midsummer Night's Dream. And what is the reality being presented? How is the romantic view of sex being, once again, ironized, undercut, undermined. Uh, and uh, in a very serious way, it's under the surface we see, once again, this play taking a very dark, tragic, realistic turn. Um, you could look at both of these two uh, problems, you know, this uh, in this scene here, this image, that remember I said that the image of Titania and Bottom that it represents, uh, 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 it's subverting this romantic image that people have of true love. It's a perverse symbol. The perverted, uh, the image has been perverted. And one of the things, one of the ways in which that, that, that romantic view of true love is perverted is this idea of uh, the realities of sex. Uh, so anyway, let's go back to Act 4. And um, again, at the end of this scene, uh, between Titania and Bottom, again, there are several ways you can interpret uh, what goes on at the end of this scene. But I would argue, and I, I don't think, you know, I've read quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of Shakespeare criticism, so it may be that I just, Pick this idea up and it's you know somewhere in my brain and I'm just not aware that I did but I don't know I think uh, other uh, other ideas of, uh, closely associated made me think of this third interpretation which I would argue is really if you're going to think about it if you're going to choose one of these th th in third interpretations if I may <laughs> you know my, if my ego may uh, uh, speak here uh, I think this third interpretation that it is a head game that's going on here. That Titania is experiencing this climactic orgasm. It's in her head. And uh, interesting, isn't it? Ironically, you know, all this time, uh, all these years I've taught this play, I think I've been teaching now three, four, five years, but I've never, I've always said Shakespeare can't find a resolution for this problem, the game of love. Everybody's going to lose. We're all coming out in the end losers. It's just the scientific facts, the philosophical truths. But, you know, of course, we're still all going to you know, die. But while we're in the game, this may be the solution, this idea, become your own lover. 
It's safe. No children. No sexual diseases. And, you know, no problems, no awkward uh, trying to understand, figure out your partner's body and uh, the problems of their, uh, your partner trying to figure out your body. Yeah, all these problems just poof, vanish like magic, don't they? Poof. With the realistic view here, that is a head game. And the, uh, the, the beauty of this game is the more powerful your imagination, the greater the orgasm, the greater the climax, and the greater the fun. And nothing can get in the way of that, that imagination of yours, I would assume, because it's up here in your head. Imagination is a huge, uh, uh, it's an important topic in this play, but the imagination is up here, and there just ain't no limits. It's not the real world. Remember the law of identity, the law of causality, the law of determinism, all these strict scientific rules that say no. No, you're limited. Not up here. At any rate, let's take a pause and I shall return. And I am back. And so, let us leave Titania and Bottom. Actually, we're not going to leave them, are we? We're going to return to them. Um, Yes, but this, let us leave this scene of Fifty Shades of Grey, or Fifty Shades of Hay, however you wish to interpret it. Uh, and uh, this idea of personal identity, again, remember, this idea that, yes, we do, we're, our identities are constantly shifting, shape-shifting, like Puck, the shape-shifter in the play. And... Uh, our identities are not fixed. They're not permanent. And uh, that point is being made here under the influence of uh, the hormones, the sex hormones, Titania. The beast within is awakened. And that can happen to us as well. We've seen the beast being awakened uh, in uh, the lovers, but here we see the sexual beast in Tatanya being awakened, and that could happen with us as well. <laughs> if you, you know, you, you could say all you like, no, I would never do such a thing. Huh? No, you want me to do what? What? Put that whip away. <laughs> no, not me. That's not for me. Well, it depends, you know, the situation. If all the variables, all the factors in the equation come together that say, get the whip out, okay, then you too could find yourself in a film called Fifty Shades of Grey. But let's turn to Titania's Awakening here at the bottom of uh, page 1379. I'm still in Act 4, Scene 1, line 101. And Oberon, of course, he's had his revenge. Uh, not fully, though. We're going to see he, he's going to want to, you know, he really wants to twist the knife in even deeper. Uh, and he, uh, so when he places, when he uh, squeezes the antidote onto Titania's eyelids and she awakens, uh, she call, uh, he, he says, now my Titania, wake you, my sweet queen. You can hear the, uh, the sarcasm in my sweet queen. Uh, because he's just had his eye, eye full. He's been watching. He's been a voyeur watching uh, Bottom and Titania uh, in the bower. And uh, he, uh, if, if the couple do, uh, if the Bottom and Titania actually do in, engage in sex, then uh, uh, Oberon has been cuckolded. We remember that uh, idea and the fear of being cuckolded in the patriarchal world. So, uh, but it may be the case, uh, remember, Oberon believes Titania has had a thing for Theseus, and, and uh, so it may be, you know, they have been together for an eternity. It may be that he's willing to be cuckolded to accept the pain and the humiliation that comes from that uh, because there is a greater pain that he's suffering. 
and it's the notion that uh, pain is still intrinsically bad in and of itself it's a bad thing being cuckolded uh, being cheated on being cheated on uh, having his wife cheating on him that's painful that can be humiliating but this other pain is greater and if in order to escape the first pain this pain that Titania has denied him the bedroom I mean that might be painful and enough, but I, I would argue that it's more his ego. He is the fairy king, and the first lines that come out of his mouth when he speaks to Titania, they're ill met, she's proud, and he says rhetorically, am not I thy lord? So this ego of his even trumps his sexual desire. And so it may be that now that he's had his revenge, he will always have this. If he chooses to tell her uh, what occurred, he will always have this to humiliate her and to shame her and uh, to lord it over her, if you will. And that will feed his ego and he will be able to maintain his position of authority. Some uh, partners in a relationship are humiliated into submission. They are shamed into uh, compliance. And uh, that's certainly one way you can interpret it. There might be others. I'll leave that up to you to think about it. Which brings up an interesting point. Shakespeare doesn't always fill in the blanks about what's motivating the characters in his plays. And I would argue that's because in reality, uh, you know, we don't fill in the blanks uh, for each other. When somebody acts a particular way, they don't necessarily explain themselves uh, to himself or herself to other people why they behave this way. Uh, you know, if I say, I'd like a Pepsi, I don't then say, oh, well, I'd like a Pepsi because here's what's motivating me. Uh, I haven't had anything to drink for the last three hours, honey, and I'm getting kind of thirsty here. And, uh, I, you know, I don't go into great detail explaining my, what's motivating me. So Shakespeare, I think he gives us enough uh, of the details into a, per, a character's behavior so that we can piece together our own interpretations. And, of course, some, I would argue, are certainly uh, more rational than others. And you may hit upon one that... Uh, uh, is actually sound here. But I think the, the most important thing is it might actually be to get us thinking about all these various interpretations and how they all ultimately uh, uh, lead back to this particular theme, in this case, love, romantic desire, and a Midsummer Night's Dream. So again, it's just playing with your imagination, making the associations, remember what I'm doing, I'm looking at little passages, finding the scientific proof, the evidence, in the image or the symbol or the illusion or the simile or metaphor. And then, like the philosopher, I'm adding up my scientific data and I'm arriving at this truth, this thesis statement, which I believe is how this play, this particular theme, the thesis becomes, the theme of the play becomes my thesis, and I believe that that's the correct interpretation of the theme, uh, or of this topic. My thesis is what the play is saying about this topic. So, that's what you do. So, Titania awakens, my Oberon, what visions have I seen? Notice what visions have I seen already. The dream's coming back to her, and she's wishing to dismiss it because she's awakening, and as she's awakening, she's, a, she's realizing the horrors, right, of what has just occurred. What visions have I seen? Methought I was enamored of an ass. Oh, the horror. Uh, Methought I was enamored of an ass. And once again, Shakespeare's punning on the word ass. One of the reasons I've been arguing that Bottom is a jackass is his head is changed into a jackass's head. 
is that uh, Shakespeare can use this to show, uh, to uh, 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 underscore, uh, use this word ass and underscore this idea of what egos can do to people. It can make them behave like asses, uh, jackasses, and he likes that word. And of course, it's also funny, the sexual pun, an ass, uh, that too. Uh, he's doing as well. But again, I would argue it's not gratuitous. He's not just trying to get the laugh. He's making a point about uh, uh, the ego yet again here. In this case, the, uh, the, the drive for sex. So when he's punning in that way, uh, when he's referring to the body part, he's, you know, he's again undercutting this romantic, idealized view of uh, uh, love and sex. Mm -hmm. So, me thought I was an of an ass, and Oberon's not gonna let her uh, dismiss it that easily. No, it won't, no dream. He says, there lies your love. And this is what I mean is, he's not quite through, is he, getting his revenge. Not quite finished with her. He's got to point it out now. He's got to shame her openly. And look what she says. <gasps> How came these things to pass? Look, what's going on? I mean, you know, she wants to present herself. Uh, uh, oh, 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 no, I mean, I, I'm innocent of all this. Uh, don't, don't suspect me. No, uh, I don't understand what happened. What happened? You know, it's like someone waking up uh, after having imbibed too much or after having been on some sort of drug high and what happened what occurred you know you you roll over in bed and go oh my god i went to bed with an ass <laughs> well, that's what you wake up in the morning and find oh my god how came these things to pass oh how my eyes do loathe this visage now oh and again this underscores this notion of personal identity and she's somebody else now when she wakes up Right? The circumstances are different. The situation's different. And here, she loathes his vision. She's no longer under the influence of the hormones of the magical flower juice that's representing the sexual hormones. And now her, you see this, uh, the identity shapeshift once more. Morph, this metamorphosis. Remember, metamorphosis is another topic in the play that you could explore. The personal identity is everywhere in the play in the characters, as we mentioned, in the background too, in the ancient Greek and ancient Roman uh, legends in the background, myths in the background. What's it saying about our personal identity? Uh, how my eyes do loathe this visage now. And look at uh, Oberon's response at the top of the next page, page 1379. Silence a while. He's got her where he wants her, doesn't he? in this abject position, this position of oh, deep, deep embarrassment. She's just mortified. She just wants to hang her fairy wings in shame. Hang up her fairy wings. She's no longer deserving of being the queen of the fairies. But here he takes that opportunity and he orders her, silence a while, shut up. We remember her, Titania, just previously telling Bottom, tie up my lover's tongue. <sighs> yeah. And here, silence. And look what he tells her next. He tells Robin to take off uh, 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 the jackass head, uh, remove the jack, to transform uh, Bottom's head uh, from that of a jackass back to uh, uh, Bottom. <laughs> That finally came out. And then again, he turns to Titania, and once more, you can hear the authority in his voice, the directive here in the directive, Titania, music call, and strike more dead than common sleep of all these five, the sense. So once again, he is taken over. He's taken charge. He now is the boss to make sauce. And she better know, where, know who she is and where 
uh, uh, where her place is. And she jumps to it. Doesn't see. Music, ho, music, such as charm and sleep. She's real willing, or she's ready and willing to obey. But she does not want to be reminded of what's happened here. She wants to just move on. Let's get past this. You want to put it as far behind you as you can. Waking up in bed with that jackass. Oh, no. You know, you want to get your clothes on quick. Run out that front door without your shoes even. Get away. And so she, uh, she doesn't uh, object. She doesn't quarrel with him in any way. She, yeah, she simply obeys his orders. And uh, he gives her yet more orders, doesn't he? Look at his line next. Uh, the sound music, he calls him, these turns to Titania. Come, my queen, take hands with me and rock the ground whereon these sleepers be. And once more she falls in love. She doesn't in any way uh, challenge him here. And so this suggests, again, this clash of egos we see here, uh, who has come out on top, once again undermining that romantic view of the uh, e e e equality in a relationship. No, this order, this patriarchal order in their relationship here, where the man dominates, is, you know, even in, uh, at the family level, here it's being reasserted. And that's what happens. Now, there is... Uh, uh, a little indication here because you imagine at this point that things will go back to as they were before although we've seen that as things were before their marriage was on the rocks I mean they you know he accuses her of infidelities she accuses him of being unfaithful and he even uh, admits to being unfaithful she denies it but he admits it I mean and then they're using this child as a kind of uh, you know um, a means toward uh, uh, meeting, each one's using that child as a means toward, meet, uh, toward uh, meeting his or her ends, uh, coming out on top. And uh, there's a suggestion here that she's going, she's going to behave now and it all will go well with this relationship. Of course, how can you really find this relationship appealing I don't even think uh, for someone like Shakespeare, he, he, you know, even though he's living in a much, much more uh, uh, strict world, uh, uh, patriarchally wise, you know, can I say that word? I guess, you know, back then women had no powers whatsoever, or very little. But at any rate, at the end of this scene, just before the fairies fly off, look what Titania says to Oberon. Now that a, time, a little bit of time has passed, she says, Come, my lord, and in our flight, tell me how it came this night that I sleep in here was found with these mortals on the ground. So, yeah, after the music, after the dance, a little time passes, maybe she's thinking, well, just how did, how did this come to pass? How did I end up here in my bower with this Jackass, what happened here? Maybe he knows a little something he's not telling me. So again, you see, there's the suggestion here at the end of their scene together, you see temporarily this clash of egos, this competition between the two has been still, has been resolved. And the, uh, the so-called correct order, the patriarchal rule, has been reestablished, which in itself is ironic. But here the irony is, it looks as if another argument may be coming over that, her, that, that horizon where they're flying off to. Uh, it looks as if she may begin to press this issue and want to know what occurred. Of course, he could always play, uh, you know, ignorant. I, I would imagine. <clears throat> but 
But just imagine if she finds out uh, what it is that, uh, that uh, ultimately he is responsible for what occurred here in her bower. So there is that suggestion here once more. <clears throat> you can feel the undertow in the ocean of love. You can feel it pulling you back out to sea where you're going to drown in that romantic view. That undertow of reality is going to pull you underneath those waves. <clears throat> Interesting. And then we turn to Theseus and Apollo. <coughs> Pardon me. Theseus and Apollo, Apollo they enter the stage. And of course, it's the day of their wedding. And uh, they are uh, off to go hunting. And look what Theseus says to her. Uh, in the morning, they've risen early. They're off to go hunting before the wedding later that afternoon. And here we are again in Act 4, Scene 1, page 1379. And at line 101, he turns to Apollo and he says, My love, he tells the uh, forester to go unleash his hounds into the woods. They're hunting. And they've got these hunting dogs, these hounds. My love shall hear the music of my hounds. Some couple in the Western Valley he wants her to hear the music of his hands. He's trying to impress uh, his bride to be. We will, fair queen, there's that fair again. We will, fair queen, up to the mountain's top, the mountain's top, where Theseus rules. That's where his ego, you can find his ego always hanging out on top of that mountain. We will, fair queen, up to the mountain's top and mark the musical confusion of hounds and echo in conjunction. So he wants her uh, to ascend to the top of the mountain and to hear his hound dogs, his hunting dogs, uh, uh, as their, their uh, 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 barks and wolves and howls and so forth echo throughout the valley below. And look at Hippolyta's response. So you can see Theseus trying to establish his superiority. His ego is in the forefront again. And he wishes to impress his bride-to-be, the queen of the Amazons. Remember their clash of egos here. And uh, look at her response at the top of the next page, page 1380. Line 110, she says, I was with Hercules and Cadmus once. So you're going to hear her, the, the emphasis on that word, I. And now she's referring to Hercules and Cadmus, who, of course, uh, these legendary heroes, uh, uh, Hercules, half mortal, but half immortal, half god. Uh, uh, and of course, Cadmus, uh, this uh, also, what does your footnote say? Yeah, he was the actual uh, founder of Thebes, a man of great importance. And she's boasting in return, isn't she? I was with Hercules and Cadmus once when in a wood of Crete they bade the bear with hounds of Sparta. So here she's trying to one up him, isn't she? Uh, look at the words she uses. Uh, uh, not only, you know, he's referred to his hounds, uh, and she discusses uh, these Spartan hounds who, uh, or is it Crete? Uh, I can't, where's the footnote here? Well, one of these, either from uh, one of these places they were known, I believe. I don't know, uh, these hounds here, they were famous in antiquity for hunting dogs. Oh yes, that's the, there's the footnote, I'm sorry. It's footnote number nine. So she's trying to impress him with these Spartan uh, dogs uh, that are famous in antiquity for being the greatest of all hunting dogs. And look what she says next. Never did I hear such gallant chiding, that word never. Never heard, never, I never heard 
such a sound as these dogs could make. For besides the groves, the skies, the fountains, every region near seemed all one mutual cry. I never, there's that word never again, I never heard so musical a discord, such sweet thunder. So here she is, oh, you know, she is challenging his manhood, isn't she? She's challenging his superiority. She's bringing to mind Hercules and Cadmus, these other men of great strength and reputation. One of them's half a god. I don't know about Cadmus. I have to look that up. But Hercules, certainly, we're all familiar with Hercules being half mortal and half uh, uh, god, and uh, <clears throat> and the the hounds as well the Spartan hounds. But Theseus is up to the challenge, isn't he? Look what he says next. My hounds are bred out of the Spartan kind. So he wants to say, my hounds are bred out of the Spartan hounds. They are the superior dogs. So hued, so sanded, and their heads are hung with ears that sweep away the morning dew. Crook kneed and dew lapped like the Syrian bulls, slow in pursuit, but matched in mouth like bells, each under each. A cry more tunable was never hollowed to, nor cheered with. Horn in Crete, in Sparta, nor in Thessaly. Judge when you hear. So, I mean, his dogs, baby, are better than even Hercules' dogs. And, 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 and Cadmus's dogs combined. He's got the bigger dogs. And we see this uh, competition, not only between uh, uh, Theseus and the uh, Hercules and Cadmus, who aren't even here, but Theseus is trying to say, my dogs are bigger than his dogs. So he's trying to assert his superiority. Uh, the dogs, of course, are rep representing his, his power and even suggesting is sexual power too, I would argue. Mine's bigger than yours, mine's better than yours. This kind of idea here. But again, it's his ego primarily here in this scene that he's wishing to establish and wishing her to respect. He wants her to seek, he wants in her eyes, he wants her to see him uh, as the epitome of manhood, if you will. Remember, I wooed thee with my sword, not only on the military battle, uh, not only, uh, only on the battlefield, militarily, but sexually, in the bedroom. And so here we have this clash of egos once again, this competition. Uh, here we've got uh, Theseus competing with Hercules and Cadmus and with uh, Hippolyta here, showing her that, oh, well, in Crete and Sparta and in this land, you never, ever heard dogs, uh, hounds, hunting dogs, uh, uh, quite as, uh, you've never heard quite such a musical discord as you hear with my, my hounds. And that brings up an interesting question here too. And once more I would say it underscores the problem of the ego, that uh, egos can in their own desires, their own needs, to be, uh, 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 as we've said, that, that uh, metaphor I've used, their own need to, in this case, to reach the mountain, to be king of the mountain, that they can't harm and uh, cause uh, discord. And here we have a kind of musical discord. No, no, notice the oxymorons uh, throughout this passage. And I think Shakespeare's warning us to hear something in that music that isn't musical at all in the sense that it isn't harmonious. Uh, again, we get the, uh, uh, back uh, on the previous page at the bottom, we get Titania's uh, or Ephesus' uh, words, musical confusion, a kind of uh, oxymoron, if you will. Remember an oxymoron is when you take two words and you shove them next to each other and then they produce a kind of, it, it, uh, these two words are contradictory. Uh, and so, so uh, I remember uh, Laurel and Hardy, the Laurel and Hardy series, uh, uh, Laurel was already saying, uh, or was it Hardy? One of them was saying to the other, it's a fine mess you've gotten us into, Ollie. A fine mess, fine mess. Fine, good, a good mess. A fine mess, 
you can see the oxymoron. Or you can think of a, a well, love, a love-hate relationship. A love-hate relationship. Love-hate. Take those two words. They contradict each other. Love-hate. Put them together. And now you've got a love-hate relationship. So it's, that's called an oxymoron. And here we've got a musical confusion. And most people, I would argue, when they think of music, think of har harmony. Of course, modern music today, uh, you know. But at any rate, and that oxymoron is going to be repeated uh, again if you look at the next page here in Hippolyta's words. So musical a discord. Again, music, you think of the chords being uh, uh, in harmony, but here we've got a discord, something that jars, something that isn't harmonious, something that's not balanced. And the dogs, the hounds are the hounds, the, the music is, is a musical discord. discord. And uh, then she uses this expression, sweet thunder. And of course, today we understand what thunder is, although it's still, you know, a warning. Here comes, uh, you know, a potential electric storm is on the way, and, uh, uh, you know, run for cover. But in, remember, in ancient Greece, I don't know about Shakespeare's day, perhaps, but in ancient Greece, uh, uh, thunder, of course, would be much more frightening because. They, most of the Greeks were romantics and they believed in Zeus and the gods and the thunder meant that Zeus was angry and here comes trouble on the horizon. So this idea of thunder is something negative and yet here it's described as sweet thunder. And I would say there's also this image in this passage of baying the bear. And in Shakespeare's day, uh, this was a sport. Most people... Uh, and all romantics, because a realist obviously couldn't enjoy such a sport, but this sport that was very popular in Shakespeare's time, a bear would be chained to a stake, and then a pack of dogs that had been trained to kill would be loosed on the bear, and the bear would be uh, mauled to death, and I mean, it just really didn't, didn't have a chance. And this was a popular sport at the time. And, uh, you know, uh, dog fighting, cock fighting. Uh, still today in some cultures, they have these, uh, um, these uh, events and they, people see them as bullfighting. They see them as entertainment. They're very popular. And all the people you can guarantee, they're romantic sitting in the audience who don't understand that a brain in pain is a brain in pain. And even today, and here we have what's going on in the valley beneath the mountain, these two egos up here trying to impress the other. And one of the means to doing that is to show off their hunting dogs, their hound dogs. And these dogs have been trained by humans to kill, to kill the bear in the wild. Not tied to a stake, but in the wild. But it's the same thing. It's a sport. They're hunting something. They're going to ruin something's day. The hounds, of course, the hounds don't understand, but the humans do. They're going to ruin some sentient being's day, something that has a brain and has a value state and is just trying to go about its day taking care of problems, avoiding harm, escaping harm, and the hounds are going to be let loose, and that's the musical discord. Ultimately, not just in the, uh, in the sounds of the hounds, the discord is in what is actually going on beneath the surface, that these animals in the wild are going to be preyed upon and brutally killed. These dogs are trained to bite, to maul, to mutilate. All in the service of making the hunter, in this case, it's a pleasurable sport for them, these hunters. In this case, Theseus and Hippolyta, both warriors who enjoy hunting. Hippolyta, they, you know, they, Hippolyta preys on men with the bow and arrow. And so all these other sports we've talked about that are no longer many cultures, we don't participate in bullfighting or cockfighting or dogfighting or, you know, if it is, it's underground. Um, but we still have hunting and fishing. 
And many people see those sports as pleasurable. And this brings up a cultural addiction. It's a way to see. You know, some people, some students in the past said, I just don't understand how they can't see some of these addictions, these cultural addictions, how they can't possibly understand the harm they're causing. Well, if you're raised in a society that uh, where many people everywhere, no one's very few, if any, object, and, and you never hear someone objecting, but it just goes back to this idea that uh, causing unnecessary harm to uh, a conscious sentient being, it's irrational and it's unethical. We provided the scientific facts and this is the philosophical truth we arrived at. Causing unnecessary harm to something that can feel, that's something that has a brain, causing unnecessary harm to that uh, 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 brain uh, is unethical, uh, is irrational and unethical. And hunting as a sport, uh, hunting and fishing, hunting and fishing period, cause unnecessary harm. You'd have to provide some need and many people put forward, they try to rationalize and put forward reasons why we just have to hunt, we just have to fish. But no, we don't. Uh, so interesting, uh, uh, you know, the conclusion we draw, you know, if causing unnecessary harm to conscious sentient beings is irrational and unethical, and if you, uh, that's the major premise of the argument, and if you subscribe to that and the minor premise, hunting and fishing cause unnecessary harm to conscious sentient beings, then you conclude one plus one equals two, hunting and fishing is irrational and unethical. That's the argument. What's the counter argument? So uh, I've come across people who've tried to rationalize, but we know these people, they, they really hunt and fish because they've been raised to enjoy it. It's a projected value. But they're, they're desperate to find rationalizations when they're presented with this argument. And so uh, it's, uh, sometimes it's just wild to what extent hunters and fishermen will go to try to get around this idea that what they're doing, the behavior they're engaging in is irrational and unethical. So they will attempt to rationalize. Uh, but uh, none of the arguments I've ever come across, and I've thought a good deal about this issue, has ever been sound. But I'll put that question out there if anybody wants to challenge that uh, for an extra credit point. You can earn an extra credit point. Um, put out a counter-argument to this notion that hunting and fishing, fishing is irrational or irrational and ethical uh, 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 pastimes. And uh, if you agree with the argument, you can have a conversation with someone and record that conversation. You know, write it down. You don't have to record, video record it, but write it down and uh, email it, that to me through Canvas. But I'm open. I'm open to counter-arguments because I'm always in search of the truth. So ultimately, if I lose an argument, I win. Because if I lose an argument, if I think I've got a sound, if I think I've got a truth and I lose that argument because there I've missed something in my thinking, well, then I'm a winner. Because now I'm an alpha thinker rather than a beta thinker on that issue. So if you disagree with this argument that I put forward, absolutely, I'd like to hear the argument. I welcome arguments. Uh, in no way are you going to be, you going to upset me I'm going to look at the argument, not who makes the argument. I don't care who makes the argument. I don't care who makes the argument. I'm looking at the argument. That's what I want to see, because I want the truth. When it comes to hunting and fishing, I want to know what's true. That's what's important to me, and I would think that would be important to most people. But a lot of people just want to be right, whether they're right or not. Even if they're wrong, they just want to be right. Anyway, so yeah, uh, I mean, this, this scene here, again, it points out, doesn't it? That would make a great topic all by itself, cultural addictions in A Midsummer Night's Dream. You could talk about the various cultural addictions we've seen here. You know, the patriarchal order, uh, uh, how women are, uh, uh, how uh, 
love is portrayed in uh, uh, this period, romantic love, you know, another cultural addiction. Uh, uh, and here we've got a, a more specific example. Uh, and you can talk about, uh, you look at one or look two or three, how do you wish to do that? But let's turn finally to where uh, here in Act 4, Scene 1, we meet uh, uh, Theseus and Hippolyta, meet the lovers. The lovers are awakening in the woods, and Theseus and Hippolyta meet the lovers. And uh, Aegeus remembers with Theseus and Hippolyta, and finally Aegeus, he has what he wants. He has at last what he desires. Proof. Proof here. Let's uh, take a break and I shall return before we turn to this next scene. And I'm back. Let's return. The lovers in the woods. Uh, uh, Theseus and Apollo and Aegeus come across the lovers in the woods. And uh, Aegeus, you can hear, uh, you can just hear the elation in his voice here. Lysander explains, he's trying to explain to Theseus uh, how he and Hermia, uh, you know, why they are here in the woods. And he, you know, he confesses that they were fleeing from the Athenian law, trying to escape, wanting to be together. And Aegeus interrupts Lysander the moment that Lysander says they were running from the law. Aegeus cries out to Theseus, Enough! Enough, my lord! You have enough! I beg the law! The law upon his head! Isn't that interesting here? Uh, the law, the law, the law! And of course we're reminded that this particular law uh, is not a just law. Shakespeare again, the irony here in this notion of the law, it's a law of might makes right. It's not has zero to do. It's all to do with the moral law that's been handed down from authority. It has nothing to do with a, uh, an ethical code that's been developed through reason. Remember, the realist subscribes to ethics. You're not going to find a realist who uses the word morality. Not a good realist. The romantic subscribes to morality. You hear that word everywhere. It's everywhere, that word morality. And what that means ultimately is somebody in authority determine the law. And you are to obey it. Not to question it, but to obey it. Because this person is a person in authority. And you do as your mama and your daddy tell you. But no, the realist says, no, I don't care if it's your mama or your daddy. I don't care if it's your teacher or your preacher. You develop a code of ethics based on reason. And this law that Aegeus is appealing to adamantly is a law that is irrational. You don't behead a daughter because she refuses to obey the daddy. You just don't do that. And uh, notice the interesting change of words here in the lines. He wants, Aegeus cries out, the law upon his head, referring to Lysander. It's not the law upon her head, Hermia. And this is very revealing because this is what Aegeus has wanted all along. He was simply using Hermia, threatening to have her beheaded, to scare off Lysander. And now he's found a way that he can get rid of Lysander permanently because Lysander is now the one. Before, Aegeus couldn't do anything to Lysander. Lysander just courted Hermia behind Aegeus' back, didn't go through the proper channels. You know, you know the code of et etiquette. But here, Lysander's broken the law. He's, Lysander has run off into the woods. He's... Uh, 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 tried to attempt to elope with Hermia, and they run from the law. And so Aegeus has Lysander just where he wants him. Just where he wants him now. 
gone, and this gone permanently. Because remember Jesus' ego and his need. Uh, and then we have uh, what I would argue is uh, yet another one of the most uh, lyrical and uh, poetic passages in the play spoken by Demetrius. Demetrius gets these lines and it's a little difficult to see here uh, this tiny print but um, yes these lines where uh, Demetrius attempts to explain to Theseus what has occurred and explains, you know, why Demetrius explains to uh, Theseus why uh, all of, they are all in the woods. They've been found all here together. And uh, here at line 182, or no, I'm sorry, 162, Demetrius says, My good Lord, I wot not by what power, but by some power it is. My love to Hermia melted as the snow. And of course, we know by what power the magical flower she is. Demetrius is unaware of the shenanigans, the goings on, uh, what occurred overnight, that uh, the fairies have meddled with the mortals. Uh, and again, remember, uh, we know what the magical fairy juice, uh, the realist would argue, represents here. Uh, my love to Hermia melted as the snow. Notice that image, that simile. Melted as the snow. His, his love to Hermia melted as the snow. Well, first of all, again, it brings to mind uh, the problems of personal identity, snow, natural element, it melts, changes, it transforms, it metamorphoses, it's translated into something of, uh, uh, you know, it's compact and of substance and hard and it melts into liquid. And uh, reminding us that the brain is physical, reminding us of the hormones, the liquid hormones, all these associations you can think of when you think of this image. His love is changed. He finds himself changed. He's no longer the Demetrius of before who longed for Hermia. My love to Hermia melted as the snow. Seems to me now as the remembrance of an idol god, which in my childhood I did dote upon. And notice again this simile. The idea of in childhood, the toys we play with, idle, trivial. He's saying his former desire for Hermia now, that desire, he, he must have been thinking like a child irrationally. In, uh, you know, a child wanting a toy. That's not being rational, simply being desirous of uh, what the child wants an idol god, and now he's put away the childhood things. He's right to reason, just like Lysander. Now he's the young adult man who understands now uh, the error in his ways and his, in his desires, which in my childhood I did dote upon. And there's that word dote. Uh, once again, this idea of desire the notion of not being able to control one's desire to dote upon in that word, you know, the, the idea of the, the drive behind that desire. And all the faith, the virtue of my heart, the object and the pleasure of mine eye is only Helena. Yes, uh, his faith, notice these words, faith, the virtue of his heart. She's the object and pleasure of mine eye. Here we have the romantic summation of true love, don't we? She has my faith, my devotion, the virtue of my heart. She's the only object and pleasure of mine eye, and that's Helena. Um, 
and we recall Helena's words, things base and vile, holding no quantity, love can transpose to form and dignity. And before we saw the irony in those words, uh, that love sees, imagines, in the base and the vile, something of worth. But here, Demetrius' behavior, his previous behavior towards Helena, you could argue was base, was vile toward her. Of course, we see that he simply can't help himself. He's fallen out of love with her, but from the romantic perspective. But love has transposed that baseness, that vileness, that word vile again. It's transposed Demetrius into form and dignity. And, uh, you know, uh, someone to respect. There's that word dignity. Someone worthy of our respect. And form, the suggestion of balance and harmony. A rational man. He's no longer a boy playing with a childhood toy. Pursuing Hermia with the soul, the essence of, of romantic desire. No, now his love is rational, and he's worthy of our respect, and he's pledged his faith. Uh, uh, and this is the sincere expression of virtue in his heart. And he's speaking these words before Theseus, the ultimate authority figure of Athens, the city of reason, the city of light, the city of truth. And so, yes, I mean, the words themselves are quite moving. And if you're Helena listening to these words, no longer can you doubt that Demetrius once more truly loves you. And that before, his behavior was, as Demetrius says next, doesn't he look? To her, to Helena, to her, my Lord, was I betrothed ere I saw Hermia, but like a sickness did I loathe this food. Again, that idea of sickness, the change in identity. Okay, like a sickness had come over him. He was no longer himself. He loathed this food. Uh, there's the word food again. Once more, we're reminded little hints, little suggestions, little indications. Remember that association between food and sex? And then we start to understand what's going on here in this passage. But as in health come to my natural taste, this is the right way of things. Again, he's now of health, a, a, a rational mind. And he sees, right, a rational man understands one plus one equals two. Uh, natural taste, the taste for the truth. But like a sickness that I loathe this food, and but as in health come to my natural taste, now, as opposed to before, that change in identity, now I do wish it, love it, long for it, and will forevermore be true to it. He's just said, listen to the irony, before I was this way, now I'm that way. And now that I'm this way, I'll always be this way. And we're reminded that the juice uh, and what it represents, that the hormones turn on, the hormones turn off, on and off, on and off. And these words, food, reminded again of the hormones, the sexual appetite that we've just witnessed in Titania, for bottom. And then we remember, don't we, that Demetrius is still under the fluent, uh, under the influence of the magical fairy juice. The antidote was placed only on Lysander's eyelids, not on Demetrius's. Demetrius is still acting under the influence of the drug. These words that he's speaking. He's hopped up, still on those hormones. That chemical concoction. That brew bubbling and boiling over in his brain. These words are being spoken under the influence of these very powerful 
You know how powerful them drugs are. These very powerful drugs. So this, you know, this lyrical, poetic, lovely, heartfelt, sincere speech that Demetrius makes before the uh, uh, state father himself, before all around him, Helena herself as well, suddenly the, the, the rugs pulled right under that truth, that romantic vision, isn't it? Everything we're reminded. He's speaking. It's the drugs, baby, that are speaking here. That's what's speaking. This ain't true love. Forevermore, true. And we're reminded there's an antidote out there. And remember, the antidote represents just falling out of love. I'm sure there's a scientific explanation for that. You know, as I was saying, the hormones are either coursing through the bloodstream or they're not. So at any rate, This is the, one of the most ironic moments in the play, I think, you would have to argue. But it's enough to convince every, uh, Theseus, certainly. Look what he says at the bottom of the page, uh, line 177. He turns to Aegeus after hearing this young, adult, rational man speak, after hearing Demetrius's pledge to Helena, and after his confession and uh, his, his profession of, of true love. He professes his true love. Theseus turns to Aegeus and says, Aegeus, I will overbear your will. And again, why has uh, Theseus decided to ignore Aegeus' plea? The law, the law, the law. And again, remember, Hippolyta is standing here. Uh, once more, I would argue, and we've seen Theseus do this before, when he gives Hermia a third option at the beginning of the play. It seems to me that the Athenian law at the beginning of the play either obey daddy or be beheaded. And Theseus introduces a third option to show that he is above the law. Even though he says he's not permitted to break the law, he does. Hippolyte is right there. He wants to assert his power, his authority, his control. He wants her to see him as the Alpha, the king of that mountain, with that sword in his hand. It's a way of his continuing to woo her. You know, he's got to be, he's got to be the winner in this ego competition with Hippolyta. Otherwise, he's going to be a loser. He don't want that. He's used to winning. This is the playboy Theseus. He's used to getting the ladies. Right? He's the lady killer. Love him and leave him. And he doesn't want to be a loser. He wants to be a lady killer. Loser or lady killer. There's a great title. You could look at Theseus' character alone in the play. Look at Theseus. Pick him apart. Analyze him. Think about his sexual desires his ego desires, and his cultural dependencies, his cultural desires, the desires he upholds because he's been brainwashed to uphold them. that make a good essay. Or pick any character in the play that you're drawn to. Helena would be a very good character to look at. She even has a soliloquy, doesn't she, in the play in Act One. So that would make a very good essay. That would be another way if, this, if the play itself is frightening you because, oh, there are too many ideas in here, I just can't digest all of them and put them in a 1,500-word you know, essay, then zero in on the character, or as I said earlier, a particular scene, and analyze that character in depth. Tell me three things about that character and find that evidence in the play to suggest that. What is the purpose of that character being in this play? What is the purpose? How is that character, for example, how is that character ultimately, to, you know, ultimately showing this contrast between love and uh, between desire, between love and reason, being rational? So, Aegeus, I will overbear your will, for in the temple by and by with us these couples shall eternally be knit. Maybe also, you know, this is Theseus' wedding day, and it looks as if the lovers, you know, Theseus, he's probably projecting here, because Theseus, when he hangs out in the woods at night with a woman, 
he has sex with that woman. So he may think that this, uh, these young lovers, that they've already engaged in sex. This is a fait accompli, as they say in French. And that, you know, it's a little too late now. It's, uh, it's, uh, they've already uh, had sex, and so we might as well marry these young couples off to who, you know, to each other, you know, the ones they want. Uh, it, so that might, and of course, as I said, it's his wedding day. Uh, this idea, you, you know, it's kind of going to sort of spoil the atmosphere, the mood of the party, of the celebration afterwards, if you go about beheading young people first. But I would argue the chief reason here is, yes, GS2 is pressing it, you know, just as he did before at GS, you know, yelling, shouting out. GS was, hey, back off, back off of GS. I'm in charge here. And I've got Apollo standing right here. You know, don't you understand? <laughs> you you got to let me take charge here, man. It's, it's it, my, my broad to beast right here. I'm the alpha in this moment. So that's what he does. For in the temple by and by with us, these couples shall eternally be knit. And isn't uh, thesis the romantic? They shall eternally be knit. When, when. Um, so Theseus is too, the romantic here. Of course he is. All of these lovers in the play are romantics. Uh, and for the morning now is something worn. Our purposed hunting shall be set aside. Isn't that interesting? This is a really nice moment in the play. Uh, I would say this is one of the highlights of this play is that uh, the hunting is going to, the hunt is going to be called off. Of course, the reasons he gives is, you know, uh, the day is, the morning is past, it's too late. And of course, we can imagine the hunt tomorrow and the next day and the next day and this horror that will continue as long as, you know, you have these egos and these cultural addictions, these desires that meet, need to be met and the Trump reasoning and most people, as I said earlier, will try to find a way to rationalize themselves around it. But at any rate, yeah, at least for this morning, the hunt's going to be caught off. No animal is going to be hunted down by a human. They're going to be hunted down by each other. I mean, the horror is going to continue. And humans commit just a bitsy, bitsy, bitsy. Point zero 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 one percent of the horror of the horror occurring in nature, the animals preying on each other. But of course the animals don't know no better. And we humans do. There's the tragic irony. But the hunt is caught off. Away with us to Athens. Three and three will hold a feast in great solemnity. And then he turns to his bride, come, Hippolyta. Yes, she's always been in his thoughts all along. There she is by his side. And he turns to her and directs her, come, Hippolyta. Hasn't he impressed her? <sighs> calling off this killing. Nothing, you know, you know nobody's going to be. Like, we're calling the killing off today. And there, the magical number three and three. This is not one wedding we're going to have now. Not two weddings, but three weddings. And that word, solemnity. He's picking up that language now. Solemnity, the romantic imagines that the wedding celebration is a sacred union. A holy matrimony. One that has been divinely ordained, blessed by the gods. It's a solemn occasion because these two lovers will pledge, these three couples will pledge to love each other truly. This is true love. And they pledge to love each other truly forever. Eternity. Happily ever after. In this world and the world to come. And the play actually uh, it's almost as if, uh, maybe I heard this somewhere, but it looks like Thesis is ready to end the play here.
But not Shakespeare. Shakespeare is not quite ready to end the play. And uh, before I end this lecture, let's do one more passage, just a little passage at the top of the next play, uh, page. And uh, we'll save the end of this scene for next time. It's, by the way, it's a very famous passage in the play, Bottom, Left Alone on Stage, speaks in soliloquy. And that, uh, if you look at the bottom of page 1382, it's often referred to as Bottom's Dream. It's a very important moment in this play, so look it over, reread it, and uh, think about it. And we'll talk uh, more in depth about it in uh, the next lecture, which I'm hoping will be the last. Uh, I think I should be able to get uh, through the rest of this play uh, tomorrow and have it online for you by tomorrow night. And that should allow you uh, enough time. Uh, but if not, remember, you have that option of, you have the extension if you need it. But let's look at this one last passage before we leave here. The lovers, all, everyone leaves the stage, but we're left with the lovers on the stage together. And look at their response. I mean, you can understand they're very confused here, of course. But look what Demetrius says. These things seem small and indistinguishable, like far off mountains turned into clouds. All, it's all been an illusion, it hasn't been real. And small, indistinguishable, I can't discern the truth behind what's happened here. Uh, you know, the, the, look at the simile, this is a great simile, isn't it? Like far off mountains turned into clouds. And, uh, you know, I'm in North Carolina, on the border of Tennessee and North Carolina, we have the Smoky Mountains, and so I've made that passage through the mountains many times. And when you approach the mountains from the distance, all you see is the smoke. From a distance, it looks like clouds. Uh, and you sort of have this opposite effect because the clouds suddenly turn into mountains, and you see the reality behind the smoke, the smoke screen. That's why they're called the Smoky Mountains, because they're always covered in the smoke screen. Uh, these clouds, these low-hanging clouds, I guess it has something to do with the atmosphere, the location, the geography, and so forth. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of variables coming in and out. I don't think it's magical. I don't think there's clouds, you know, I don't think Zeus is hanging up there in those clouds. But at any rate, the far-off mountains here are turned into clouds, and from far away, you know, the mountains turn into clouds, and it's far away now. We can't see those mountains was it real? It seems like it turned into clouds now. It seems like it was just an illusion, just a dream. And uh, Hermia agrees, me thinks I see these things with parted eye, when everything seems double. And here again, uh, this idea of now she's not seeing clearly. She can't discern what occurred last night. And when she looks back, it's as if, oh, her vision, what, what happened? What happened in the woods last night? So that's, that's the theme here. These lovers are saying, what happened? I just don't understand. What, what went on in those woods last night? And look what Helena says, and I have found Demetrius like a jewel. And there's that simile, like a jewel. And Demetrius, he does appear in that speech, that, that lyrical lovely speech, that romantic speech before Theseus and everyone else, before Helena, who's heard these words too, he is, you know, the brightest jewel in the heavens now. He's sparkling like a jewel because he has become the form of Demetrius. Now he, once again, and so uh, he's mine own and not mine own. She's thinking, you know, here, that doesn't make, before he wasn't mine. But now he is. That, was that a dream, that time when he wasn't mine? Was it all an illusion? Was it in my imagination? So all these lovers. And look, Demetrius says here, uh, uh, what does he say next? That we are awake? He says, are you sure that we are awake? It seems to me that yet we sleep, we dream. It seems as if yet we are sleeping, we are dreaming. 
And again, this tendency, this desire, the, the, the past, and they may be actually feeling this as if it were a dream. Uh, but I, you know, when you're in the dream itself, if you think about when you're in the dream, it does feel real, but upon awakening, you realize, no, it wasn't real. And you, you know, you discern the difference between reality and the dream world. It's only while you're dreaming that you imagine the reality. If not, we'd wake up, wouldn't we? And we, we would be thinking, I, I must still be in a dream world. But no, very few of us, I would say, unless we're deluded or perhaps deranged, think that suddenly we're once more away, we're once more in a dream world when we awaken. Uh, in a sense, they're in a new dream world, aren't they? The dream, the reality here for them is that they've all, you know, they're now, each is in love with the, 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 the object of his or her desire. This is a kind of dream that they're inhabiting, whereas the dream before was a kind of nightmare, wasn't it? And they've awakened from that, but they still can't quite discern, are they, is this just a dream? Is this too good to be true? So a lot is going on in this passage, isn't it? It may be in one way, I would argue, we've seen it with Titania, this wish to deny what occurred in the middle of the night, because, you know, if you look back on your dream, you recognize that was a dream. That wasn't real. And to look back on the night before, these lovers have to know that their behavior was real. And we've seen it with some really ugly behavior. But now, like Titania, they are shamed. They are humiliated. They are embarrassed by their behavior. Now that they, you know, the nightmare has passed, they each have uh, uh, what they desire. Each one has what he or she desires. But it may be a way of trying to move away that the, the mirror of nature that was held up to them in which they saw themselves, they saw a different aspect of themselves, one they couldn't possibly imagine. Remember that old uh, slapstick comedy scene introduces this notion, well, it was introduced before, but this idea of personal identity, the problems with personal identity. So it may be that they want to, they're attempting to repress, they're wanting to forget, they're wanting the, what occurred to be swallowed up by their subconscious. The jaw, let the jaws of darkness of the subconscious swallow up all that you know, confusion. We have kind of inverted notion here, don't we? It's near, here are the jaws of darkness. You know, they're, the good dragon, Puff the magic dragon. Let that dragon swallow up not, not the you know the bright the good bright things, but that confusion, that nightmare. Yes, and uh, you know they want to dismiss, forget. Perhaps they're attempting to rationalize, as we said earlier here. We want people. We all want to rationalize when we misbehave. We all when we all do something we know. Or even if we don't know, and as someone says, you know, and points it out, oh, our first attempt is, oh, no, not me. Yeah, we all, we're all human, and we all want to see ourselves as you know, important, special. Don't you call me a loser. Don't you tell me I'm irrational. Don't you tell me I'm unethical. Yeah, and here, you know, they're not wanting to confront the behavior of the night before, just as we've seen with Titania. Oh, my Oberon, what visions have I seen? Me thought I was enamored of an ass. And Oberon has to point it out. There's no one here to point it out to these lovers. And they're not going to start pointing fingers at each other. They have what they want. They don't want to remember. Remember Hermie and Helen, the best friends. Look how they were behaving. Demetrius and Lysander are ready to kill one another. So this idea of dream and reality, I mean, it could just, you know, that tennis ball can go back and forth. Am I in a dream? Is this reality? Where are we? Uh, but, you know, it's a rationalization, isn't it? I think most of us, unless we're actually in the dream, know that uh, 
this is the reality. When the lovers wake here, there may be a moment when they think they might still be drinking, but I would argue that moment's long past here. I don't know, I might be wrong on this point. I might. Do some thinking in that in your journal. Do some thinking in that, on that, perhaps, in your journal here. Um, the last thing I'll say here uh, before I close this lecture is that we've seen the competition between these egos in the woods, the competition, and uh, where that can lead, the violence, you know, the potential violence, uh, where that's headed, where that can head. And uh, here, of course, the conflict has been resolved. So does that mean everyone's a winner? And I was thinking about this idea. Um, the romantic, of course, would imagine, yes, you know, the couples here, they've all won. Lysander has Hermia, and Demetrius <clears throat> has Helena. Lysander and Hermia. But then, you know, Lysander gets Hermia, but there, that means all the other young men in Athens don't get Hermia. They don't get her. So there are lots of losers who might want Hermia, and they don't get her. They don't get the piece of the pie they want. And uh, brings into question this idea. Not, not, I'm not saying that Hermia's a prize. <laughs> Uh, yummy piece of pie. She's not a uh, you know she's not a blue ribbon prize at the at the bake off at the fair, but nevertheless, in many men's eyes, she might be. She's thought fair through all of Athens, and Helena is as well. There might be Demetrius gets Helena, and that means a lot of losers if other others desire Helena. And is Lysander the best choice for Hermia? Who knows? I mean. It may, you know, their relationship, he might actually, uh, their relationship, it might not be a good relationship for Hermia. She might have been better off ultimately in the end with some other young man perhaps in Athens who is rational and is ethical and is productive. Not one of these privileged, wealthy young darlings Handed, like Demetrius and Lysander, handed. Don't have to earn, don't have to produce, don't have to get up off that couch and go out there, put on their janitor clothes, and go out there and start cleaning up mess and trying to clean up their own mess as well. We all make a lot of mess. There's a lot of mess we make. You gotta try to make as little mess as possible, right? But yeah, I mean, there might have been there might have been a Shake, young Shakespeare out uh, there in Athens uh, who longed for Hermia or Helena, and now he's not going to, uh, man, he might have had an impact on Helena or Hermia. It's very hard to see either Lysander or Demetrius having a, a beneficial, a positive impact on these two young girls or on these young girls having a, you know, a good impact on these young men. Uh, I mean, I'm going to argue they're all ruled by their desires and they're all interested in their own needs and their own happiness, their own happy ever after ending. They're really missing, aren't they? These, they they're really not grasping the basic scientific facts and the, the fundamental philosophical truths that just ain't that hard to discover. But they haven't discovered anything. Certainly, Theseus and Apollo have. Now, Oberon and Titania, I mean, we see what, you know. But at any rate, it's something to think about, you know, this idea of the romantic notion that destined meant to be. Now, that might not be a good thing. You have two romantics come together. They might be stuck in that romantic view of the world. <clears throat> they might be, you know, imagining that comic optimistic plot line and be thinking that that is the direction they should be heading in the service in the name pursuing their happiness with that soul of love it's their happiness that matters you're 
remember the comic Optimus plot line is the happiness of the hero and the heroine. It's the happiness of the jackass that matters, not for the tragic pessimist. It's the ending of the suffering for all that are on the stage of life, of existence. Everyone on that stage matters. It's our desires that don't allow us to see that. Our upbringings, our desires, our egos, our drugs. It's we each want a big piece of pie. The bigger, the yummier, the better. And the tragic pessimist keeps reminding us no come back to reality, understand what is of most value, what is most important. And this is a kind of, at this moment with the lovers, you know, they imagine what occurred was merely a dream, a nightmare. And they wonder, can this be real? Now we're in the real world. They've, they've awakened from a nightmare into the dream world. They find themselves in Disneyland, the park doors are open. They still can't quite believe it. They want to forget that nightmare. And they want to enter those gates, those pearly gates of that magical kingdom. That's where they wish to go. And so they're going to dismiss the past, just a nightmare. Was it real? Um, and uh, at this moment that they come together and they're united here, uh, this moment of joy and happiness, Shakespeare just keeps reminding us they haven't ripened to reason. They haven't matured. Touching now the point of human skill, reason. They haven't ascended the right mountain, have they? The mountain where at the top you find not Zeus or desire, but reason. And uh, Bottom is going to remind us in Bottom's dream uh, which mountain we ought to be climbing. He's going to do that uh, once again indirectly. But uh, we'll see in the next passage where we meet again. In the meantime, uh, read Bottom's dream before you go off to dreamland. And I will see you in the next lecture. Hopefully the last. I do my best. Be gone.